Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, November 9th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by our students, Sabrina Thaler. Thank you. And afterwards, we will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Thaler. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the November 9th agenda. M Dr. Williams or Ms. Charlie Green, rather, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Madam Chair, I am unaware of any additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Thank you. All right, then hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that, I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Chief of Staff Charlie Green, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements. Are there any questions? Resignations. Questions? Leaves. Questions? Deceased recognition of service. Any questions? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D-4? So moved, Mac. Is there a second? Second, Thomas. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. <laughs> yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams and Ms. Charlie Green. Madam Chair and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Principal, Catonsville Center for Alternative Studies. Principal, Meadowood Education Center. 
Principal, Milford Mill Academy. Assistant Principal, Deer Park Middle Magnet School. Assistant Principal, Dogwood Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Woodlawn High School. Assistant Principal, Woodlawn Middle School. Enterprise Systems Engineer, Office of Network Support. Senior Applications Administrator, Office of Enterprise Applications. Supervisor, Secondary Math, Office of Mathematics. Supervisor, Visual Arts, Office of Visual Arts. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E-1? So moved, Mac. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Thomas. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I am pleased to announce the following appointments, and there should be slides accompanying. Thank you so much. First, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Robert Brooks, currently a network analyst, network support in the Office of Network Support Services, moving to the position of Enterprise Systems Engineer, Office of Network Support Services. Mr. Brooks has 14.4 years in Baltimore County. Congratulations to Mr. Brooks. Next, Ms. Camille Gibson, currently a teacher of art at Golden Ring Middle School to the position of supervisor of visual arts in the Office of Visual Arts. Ms. Gibson has 7.2 years in Baltimore County. Congratulations to Ms. Gibson. <laughs> Next up, Ms. Ashley Harris, who is currently an educational consultant with Katherine Johnson Global Academy, Calverton Elementary Middle School and Baltimore City Public Schools to the position of Assistant Principal at Dogwood Elementary School. Congratulations and welcome to BCPS, Ms. Harris. <laughs> Next, Mr. John Klug, currently an Assistant Principal at Catonsville Center for Alternative Studies to the position of Principal, Catonsville Center for Alternative Stu Studies. Mr. Klug has 21 years in Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations, Mr. Klug. <laughs> Next, we have Mr. Daniel Miller, currently a physical education teacher at Deer Park Middle Magnet School to the position of assistant principal at Deer Park Middle Magnet School. Mr. Miller has 4.2 years in Baltimore County. Congratulations to Mr. Miller. Next, we have Mr. Brett Parker, currently a teacher, a resource teacher in the Office of Mathematics, moving to the position of supervisor, secondary math, in the Office of Mathematics. Mr. Parker has 6.2 years of service to Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations to Mr. Parker. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Dana Quainu who is currently a resource teacher at Catonsville Center for Alternative Studies, moving to the position of assistant principal at Woodlawn Middle School. Ms. Quainuk has 14.4 years of service to Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations to Ms. Quainu. <laughs> Next, Mr. Carl Rade, who is an assistant principal at Meadowood Education Center, moving to the position of principal Meadowood Education Center. Mr. Rade has 15.2 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations, Mr. Rade. <laughs> Next, Ms. Tyra Scott, currently a special education teacher at Woodlawn High School, moving to the position of assistant principal at Woodlawn High School. Ms. Scott has 9.2 years of service to Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations, Ms. Scott. Next, Ms. Trila Shipman, currently an assistant principal at Milford Mill Academy to the position of principal, Milford Mill Academy. Ms. Shipman has 24.2 years of service to Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations, Ms. Shipman. 
next with Antoinette Weber, uh, currently uh, and the Office of Student Information, Rep currently, pardon me, a Student Information Reporting Analyst in the Office of Enterprise Applications. She is moving to the position of Senior Applications Administrator in the Office of Enterprise Applications. Ms. Weber has two, uh, has two years of service to Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations to Ms. Weber and congratulations to all of tonight's appointees. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. However, as appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who register to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of the board and the school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. It is the practice of the board to allow elected um, uh, officials to provide their comments to the board first to speak. I don't know that we, let's see. We do, we have an elected official, Delegate Harry Bindari. Oh, I apologize. Um, it's the chief of staff for um, Mr. Bindari. Jacob Took. Okay. Okay, well, we will. I don't know if he is here, so we will go to the next name. Um, next is our stakeholder. Our, uh, I now call on our advisor and stakeholder group leaders to speak. And first is Billy Burke from case. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Ms. Charlie Green, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Case members continue to struggle with a crushing workload. It is hard to explain just how many extra hours the staffing shortages, bus driver shortages, vaccination and testing monitoring, and community notification are taking, but administrators and central office staff are at their breaking point. I spend time each week answering questions about how to resign or how to retire. People need work-life balance, and there are a lot of other work options out there now besides education. Every board meeting should be a discussion on solving the staffing crisis. 
Every board meeting should be a discussion on attracting and retaining administrator and central office staff. Implementing Kerwin will begin to address the base salary of teachers, but if case salaries don't increase at the same rate, there will be little or no reason to work for an administrative promotion. Why would someone go from hourly employment with overtime protections and pay to a job where you can be asked to work 16 hours a day with less protection, more work responsibility, and non-commensurate compensation? The efficiency review has become a source of fear for administrators and central office staff. They fear that anyone can be removed or demoted or reassigned without consideration for job performance, years of service, and loyalty. If it can happen to my boss, it can happen to me. In my last membership meeting, the common theme was working scared, keeping your head down, don't suggest changes. BCPS has always struggled to get people to take high pressure central office positions. Why would anyone want to move into leadership that is unrepresented and unprotected? Finally, it's a sign of strength in leadership to revisit old decisions to see if they are sound. Please ask your Muslim and Jewish teachers to reach out to the board to tell you how the faith-based designated PD days are working for them. Please ask the administrators, central office staff, and teachers preparing the PD how the faith-based designated PD days are working for them. At the time, it felt like a good compromise. We need a new solution. Some decisions feel good and just, but they don't work. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Cindy Sexton from Tabco. Good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Ms. Charlie Green, and members of the board. Your inboxes, I am certain, are being filled, as mine is, with articles of what other counties in Maryland and in the country are doing to address the workload and the mental health of our educators. The situation is untenable and must be addressed. We have been in conversations and brainstorming sessions with Dr. Williams and the other union leaders to look for ways to provide relief for our staff. TABCO has reached out to its members to have them share ideas. Many of these are long-term solutions and that is great, but we also know everyone is looking for something immediate. I appreciate that you are working with us to find some immediate solutions. My ask is that through our collaboration, we decide upon and share a plan with our staff as quickly as possible. They hear that we are meeting, discussing, talking, but they don't see a resolution, and that is adding to the stress, angst, and frustration. I know there are many moving parts. Let's please get through that so staff knows they have been heard and that the unions and BCPS truly are addressing the concerns and working on providing relief. Another topic we have discussed is the ongoing payroll certification and benefit questions and issues. I shared with Dr. Yarbrough the list of TABCO members who are affected, and that list has been given to the appropriate departments. I want to thank the staff in those departments for all they have been doing to work through the problems since the ransomware attack. Many of them are members of our sister union, ESPBC, and we appreciate their work and diligence. But now I am hearing with renewed urgency that these issues must be completed by the end of this calendar year. Our staff needs to know that the problems are resolved, the monies have been paid that are owed, and that our W-2s will be accurate. We have requested a data dashboard or some type, of, some type of tracker so it will be apparent that the issues are being addressed and the tasks completed. And my third topic is around the compensatory service reviews our special educators have done and the coverages many TABCO members have had this year. It was agreed that this would be compensated work and we have been working on an MOU for several weeks. And again, I appreciate the work that we have done, but we need the next step. Our members need this compensation 
And my ask is that we get the MOU signed so payroll can process the timesheets and the staff get paid. Let's find a way to give our staff some time. Let's see what we can possibly have removed from the workload. As I've said before, every single task simply cannot be a priority. Our educators are at their breaking point, yet still doing all they can for our students. Can we please move with a sense of urgency around these topics to bring closure and resolution? Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bash Farone. I'm sorry, of the Central AEAC. Good evening to all. The Central Area meeting on November 3rd was informative and was attended by about 28 persons plus the speakers. Both Ms. Shea, Ms. Hernandez, Ms. Grosser pointed to what BCPS offers in world languages and the process of learning, proficiency, and the focus on the meaning and on communication. BCPS goal is for students to survive and strive in an ever connected world. However, BCPS offers little world languages beyond Spanish. It was an engaging meeting. Special thanks to Ms. Cozzi for attending and for participation. The central area basically requests the school system to add the teachings for Italian, Arabic, and Chinese languages. A second language is a window into the economic opportunities for our graduate students. Italian is really a beautiful language. It is rich in culture, history, and of course, Italy is part of the G7 economies. For Arabic, the population of the 22 Arabic countries is 420 million. Arab Renaissance was delivered to Europe through Spain and through Italy. The Muslim population, which speaks Arabic, totals almost 1.9 billion in the world. For the Chinese language, China is 1.4 billion population, and it is a great economic and cultural market for our graduate students. When you know the language, then you understand the others, and it makes us, the United States, stronger economically and may avoid painful foreign adventures. This is why the central area believe adding Italian, Arabic, Chinese languages in the elementary level and beyond is vital for our economic prosperity and for the safety and security of the state of Maryland and the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Diana Caligari from AFSME. Good evening, Superintendent Dr. Williams and members of the board. My name is Deanne Caligari, and I am a proud employee of the Transportation Department of Baltimore County Public School System and newly elected Secretary of ASME, Local 434. I am here with permission and on the behalf of the President, Brian Epps, where we represent all ASME workers who support the critical infrastructure of our school system. I am here before you today to express my concerns with regards to the current state of working conditions for myself and coworkers within the school system. Dedicated employees like myself continue to weather the storm of the unprecedented health crisis, COVID-19. 
the pandemic has impacted nearly all elements of our lives. We are here to bring three calls to action to the board today. The system needs to address the ongoing staffing sh shortage by supporting workers through the process that comes with pre-employment. This can be done by streamlining and, and improving the process required before securing job placement. Two, the board can make positions more attractive and long-lasting places of employment, thus enabling the removal of contractors from all our school facilities, which is nothing more than a stopgap measure that does nothing to address the shortage of staff that we see in our schools today. Three, last but not least, we call for a fair and livable wage paid paying our employees at least $15 an hour and adjusting the other hourly and, sa and salary according to meet with the rising costs associated with, the li with living, inflation, and our changing economy. Many of the actions we are calling for are contained within the Baltimore County Public School Operational and Efficiency Review Report released this past September. We are calling for can also be supportive by utilizing pandemic fund relief. As our members have uh, supported the mission of Baltimore County, we will continue to do our jobs to make a more efficient and effective system. All of our ASME members have been on the front lines since March 13th 2020. When schools and offices were closed, ASME members were the only ones who were required to be here in the buildings. We thank Superintendent Dr. Williams for his leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have student, mem um, student stakeholder comments from Darian Law. Okay, don't see the student member. Um, we have uh, Mr. Jacob Took, the Chief of Staff from Delegate Harry Bendari's office has arrived. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jacob. I'm here from the office of Delegate Harry Bendari. Um, and he sends his regrets. He's not able to be here this evening, but I'm just gonna read a letter to you all. To the Superintendent Williams, BCPS, and the Board of Education, I would like to ask that Baltimore County Public Schools please adopt a resolution recognizing the Festival of Diwali or Deepawali as an important cultural tradition which must be honored in our classrooms and schools. Diwali or Deepawali, which are variations on the same festival and cultural practice, is a celebration of light, joy, and beauty but it is more than a celebration. It is an ancient tradition and a much anticipated time of year for participants to come together with family and friends to share in the blessings of breaking bread, of singing and dancing, of telling stories and making new memories. In short, it is a cornerstone of community building, especially for folks in, um, in the American diaspora from South Asia, where the celebration of Diwali is widespread. These communities are growing here in Baltimore County and should be welcomed and supported by our public institutions. Failing to appropriately recognize Diwali excludes hundreds if not thousands of students from, and their families, sending a signal that our school is not for them. I'm proud of the work our school district does to serve families across Baltimore County, and I know this is not the signal our district's leadership intends to send. We must adapt, as American schools have done time and time again in the past. We must become more inclusive to affirm and respect the identities and backgrounds of all our students. This year, we saw the White House share a wonderful message honoring the celebration. Clearly, recognition of Diwali is growing more mainstream. We can't let BCPS fall behind on this. Diwali is among the most significant holidays for those who celebrate. We can say the same about Lunar New Year, Eid al-Fitr, and other days not currently acknowledged on the BCPS calendar. When we learn about America, we learn that diversity is a strength. But if we don't see ourselves and our cultural practices honored, how can we believe in the strength of that diversity? 
So I'm gonna end with a quote from Delaney High School junior Michelle Wang, who recently published an op-ed in Delaney student newspaper, The Griffin, calling on the district to recognize these holidays. Wang writes, this is an important issue, not of arbitrary holidays, but of fundamental respect and fairness to students. Baltimore County, along with other school systems, should not have to compromise cultures for the sake of status quo. Well said, Michelle. Again, we can't let BCPS fall behind on this. Please take the lead. Please heed these calls for change now because these communities will only continue to grow. And as they do, calls for BCPS to do the right thing will get louder. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we will have public comment. And our first speaker is Courtney Everett. Hello, thank you for your time this evening. I'm a mother of four, three are currently enrolled in a Baltimore County Public School. I'm also a registered nurse and I've worked full time through the pandemic. My husband also works in healthcare and a rehab center as an OT. You may be aware the large numbers of healthcare workers, despite the growing need, are leaving their profession due to the challenges COVID-19 has presented, especially that of caring for school-aged children. I have personally felt the effects of coworkers who've left to care for their struggling children. It's an understatement to say the COVID-19 pandemic school closures have had a profound negative effect on my family. And I would like to ask the board to do whatever it takes to keep our children in school by implementing more robust COVID prevention strategies. Virtual learning did not work well for my family. Now that BCPS schools are open in person, COVID-19 mitigation strategies currently in place are not working well. Many children, including my own, are being placed on long quarantines, which disrupts learning. Additionally, quarantine procedure makes little to no sense. When my daughter was exposed to COVID on her school bus and required to quarantine for 10 days, we received a call on a Wednesday and apparently the quarantine period started on the past Friday when she was exposed, yet still attending school until the Wednesday call. I was told that her two siblings who attend different schools were not required to quarantine or get tested. However, we know this disease can spread easily in asymptomatic individuals. Frequent quarantine without testing for suspected COVID doesn't make sense. This is especially relevant for small children like my own daughter who has autism and thrives on routine. Interrupting a child's school routine can create anxiety and cause behavior problems. This is not only making it hard for children, but the teachers and school staff who are faced with managing such. There are many school districts, including Baltimore City, who are conducting routine testing on asymptomatic students and staff to control community spread. I propose BCPS develop and implement a plan for more routine testing, as well as masking and social distancing policies that are strictly enforced, and children who do not comply should be held accountable, not permitted to attend in person. I also do not feel vaccine status should exclude individuals from being tested, as I know two individuals who recently succumbed to COVID who are fully vaccinated. Vaccine manufacturers do not claim COVID-19 prevents the spread, but merely decreases severity of illness and mortality. The CDC recommends testing as part of a multi multifaceted prevention. I feel BCPS should institute mandatory routine testing on all staff and students. After all, in Maryland, weekly and at times bi-weekly COVID testing has been required in nursing homes of employees and residents since the spring of 2020. Aren't our children's lives and well-being just as valuable as the residents? Thank you. Keep our kids in school. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicolino Apeluso. Good evening, everybody. Tutto bene? Welcome. Um, it's not great to see you again. So, um, uh, Chairman Scott, uh, member of the Baltimore County Board of Education. Um, as it was mentioned before, 
um, we had a meeting. I'm uh, Nicolina Plaus, by the way, Professor Nicolina Plaus, a member of the advisory council in the central area, here in the Baltimore County uh, area. And uh, uh, we had a meeting with uh, uh, Ms. Megan Shea, Mr. Hernander, to talk about the situation with the world languages in the central area, but also overall in the county. And I'm here uh, to bring to your attention, we are, as the advisory council, are really the voice of the Baltimore County community. And here today, uh, I would like to give voice to our uh, Baltimore County resident. Mr. Zarchin uh, has also copies of uh, what I'm holding in my hand here. These are um, emails from parents, all uh, residents of the Baltimore County area. And uh, you can see there are about 14 of them. There is uh, actually more, and uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, so please read them when you have time today. Um, as you can see, is the voice of our Baltimore County community residents uh, in connection to the need and the demand, really, to have a, a wider offering for foreign languages. Uh, I'm going to read one in particular that I found very, uh, very important, and it's from Valerie Viner. She lives in Parkton. Many are from Townsend, Lutherville. She says, I would love to see my kids learning Italian language and culture in their schools, and I would prefer that it gets incorporated into elementary school first, because the earlier you, get, you begin, to, the easier it becomes to be more proficient in any languages. And then, the course, they should be able to continue learning the language in their middle school and high schools. Now, I mention this because uh, it is true. We have a very big uh, county, almost a million residents, but this is what we get for elementary school for foreign languages. Huh? What do you see? Only one language, Spanish. For all the school in the entire Baltimore County area, only one language at the elementary school level seems to me that we can make history, and uh, perhaps uh, with your help and assistance, we can offer and uh, meet these uh, needs of our community members. As you can see, in the middle school, we have a few bunch of hands full of languages. There's no continuity between middle school and high school. Chinese is offered in two middle school, Arbor and Hereford, and uh, at the high school level, in only one high school, where French, Japanese, at the high school level, German. There's no continuity. continuity. So we're here. Um, to ask really for your help in bringing this further. And also to make history, because uh, Maryland, as you can see here, was made uh, through the wor hard work of George Calvert that uh, created a refugee camp for Catholic and all different religions. And we are the only state modern, the old 50 state of the United States that is not in Latin, but in Italian, as uh, George Calvert was a translator and the secretary of the King James I. And he cost his life when, at the end, uh, he declared to be Catholic. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amaya Moko Martin. Hi, thank you for, for listening to me. The school where my daughters are attending has recently identified by the Maryland Health Department as having an outbreak. I have considered homeschooling them temporarily because of safety concerns and the lack of alternative options, but because this is a charter school and because of Maryland State Department of Education policy about mandatory withdrawal for lack of attendance, they will lose their placement at their beloved watershed charter school an unnecessary traumatic experience that will affect them long term because of the unique educational opportunities that this wonderful charter school is enabling. There are students at Watershed that have already lost their places due to lack of options for retaining a spot, a spot at the school while pursuing alternative education as a result of health concerns. I know that the policy regarding the lottery for charter schools, like holding a place while students withdraw temporarily to homeschool, and the policy regarding mandatory withdrawal for lack of attendance comes from the Maryland State Department of Education. But the BCPS Board of Education have a strong say in whether an exception to either policy is made. I am asking you to do to also advocate for your charter school students so there is a level playing field with other students in public schools across the country, the county, sorry, who are able to withdraw to homeschool and re-enroll 
in their schools upon their return. A related request also in the spirit of ensuring a level field for charter school students is in regard to the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. Baltimore County is the only county in Maryland with charter schools that hasn't given charters a per pupil allocation of ESSER. The purchases that were made with those funds, like curriculum, were not relevant for the charter school. Watershed, I know, has not received any facility dollars either. Prince George County took a similar path and after being challenged by lawyers, ended up retroactively distributing $24.4 million to their nine charter schools. My request is that Watershed Public Charter School receives a fair share of for ESSER funding that is so needed to address the needs of its students. We need testing. For all, for, all, for all students, a critical piece, this is a critical piece that is needed. Um, the data indicates that 50 to 60% of cases are spread by individuals with no symptoms. This is what is fueling the outbreaks in BCPS schools. To prevent the spread of, uh, uh, in the, ba the Baltimore City public schools are participating, all the elementary students in these schools are participating in weekly group screening that provides early detection of COVID even when there are no symptoms. The group samples are tested together and if a pool tests positive, the students are individually tested. My request is that BCPS implements this group testing in BCPS schools in the same way as the Baltimore City public schools do. We need to stop and prevent outbreaks in BCPS schools. They are a health concern that puts the affected. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Tabling. Thank you to all the board for your time and to Ms. Green as well. Um, I am a former Baltimore County public school teacher and library assistant. I'm a retiree. Unfortunately, there is no association like TABCO to speak for the retirees who've served you well. Um, you were all aware of the ransomware attack and my source for um, what is happening to uh, correct the problems and see that we are receiving the monies we are owed that are being withheld because of that problem, I need to rely on the media to find out. Last week I heard from TABCO that 400 employees continue to see errors in their check. Um, and as recently as October 28th, the superintendent um, told WBA reporter Dr. Tim Tootin, and I quote, we're working aggressively to rebuild and in some cases replace some of the tools and applications that we had before. So that's all I'm able to provide at this time. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. I would like to know whether the repairs are being made slowly and manually by current staff only, or has a dedicated contractor been hired to correct this problem? What is the projection for a new functioning payroll system? And finally, when will I, and other retirees and employees see the monies that we are owed by BCPS. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roa Hassan. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Superintendent Williams, and members of the BCPS Board of Education. My name is Roa Hassan, I'm a junior at Perry Hall High School, and it's excellent to be in this boardroom before all of you here once again. The last time we spoke, I shared with you student concerns and the importance of the student voice, the necessity of the student voice. Today is no different. The issues I brought to your attention the last time I was in this room remain prevalent. The student voice remains to be an adequately heard by this Board of Education, as the needs of our 111,000 students have not been addressed. We continue to scream out from our classrooms, however, this time we've been in the school building and have experienced this system of education for an entire academic quarter. And with that comes the realization once again of how broken and flawed our system is upon to our return to our respective buildings. Upon returning to the school building, BCPS students collectively noted the lack of safe and equitable infrastructure needs. From the dripping ceilings that crumble to the lack of functioning HVAC systems, this issue is experienced by almost every single school in the county. And I must emphasize that this is an unsafe learning environment. Our students in low-income areas are disproportionately affected, and as you consciously choose not to address these issues, you are putting students at risk. 
the education of young people who walk into the school building five days a week to further their education is put in jeopardy as a direct result of your ignorance. This is no longer just a matter of budgetary spending. It is the importance of the physical environment of our schools and the elimination of harmful distractions to our education. This is an issue that needs to be solved for the safety and well-being of our students, teachers, and staff. We cannot continue with unfulfilled promises and false guarantees when the reality is our school buildings are falling apart just as our systems are. Similarly, the transition from virtual to in-person instruction is failing to return us back to normal, and we mustn't minimize the long-lasting impacts of the pandemic on our academic interactions. We have students who are disproportionately failing their classes because it has been over a year since we've been in an in-person academic setting. This doesn't mean that the pandemic, that during the pandemic, our students have become less intelligent. It means that the resources we need to academically flourish are unavailable to us, and that the learning that we need does not consider the visible trauma that all of us have experienced. Therefore, I must ask you, for whom do you hold your position? Because the only answer should be the students. I ask you to take direct action and responsibility for the current failures of our school system for the benefit of all students as you consider curriculum, infrastructure, and equity. I ask you to deliberately evaluate your decisions to guarantee safe infrastructure and curriculum that values student mental health and trauma after a global pandemic. We need change and we need your support. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michelle Wang. Good evening, distinguished board members. My name is Michelle Wan, and I'm a junior at Delaney High School. I recently wrote an article for my school's newspaper titled, Opting for an Inclusive School Calendar. And coincidentally, I found out that today, the board is voting on next year's calendar. With that, I'd like to call attention to the current disproportions. Our county currently serves a diverse range of students, yet holidays in many cultures do not receive recognition. We currently have days off for holidays such as Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. Yet other holidays such as Lunar, Lunar New Year, Eid al-Fitr, and Diwali are not recognized in the same manner. For Muslim students, Eid al-Fitr marks the end of the holy month of Ramadan. My friend Hassan says that I'd love the opportunity to visit family and just celebrate our culture for, our, for a day. In the past few years, missing school for Eid has actively affected my Eid day to be more stressful as I can't feel f fully immersed in a holiday when I know that I'll be struggling to play catch up for the classes I've missed. BCPS must do better in recognizing significant holidays from a diverse range of cultures and embracing those who celebrate them. Presently, BCPS currently recognizes Columbus Day, I find it awfully hypocritical to celebrate a holiday that recognizes the atrocities committed by Christopher Columbus, yet no recognition for the major holidays of Hinduism and Islam. So the question becomes, which holidays should be prioritized? And such significant ones like Lunar New Year, Diwali, and Eid are a must. I urge the board to prioritize these holidays and implement professional days for them. Modifying the calendar is not something new. Across Maryland, we have already seen other counties opting for these changes. In 2016, Howard County Public Schools voted to extend days off to Eid al-Adha, Lunar New Year, and Diwali. In addition, Montgomery County's 2021-2022 calendar included professional days for teachers and no schools for students on Lunar New Year and Eid al-Fitr. Baltimore County is clearly behind. With the increasing student diversity that we pride ourselves on, modifying the calendar to be more inclusive should be an indisputable component of diversity. This is an issue not just about having days off for holidays, it's about fundamental equality and fairness. It is important to recognize these holidays to promote acceptance of cultures, and therefore we need to implement these professional days. Modifying the calendar to be inclusive must be a priority, and adding professional days for holidays such as Lunar New Year, Diwali, and Eid is a necessity. I'll be a senior next year, and my sincerest hope is that before the time I graduate, BCPS will have implemented modifications in building a more inclusive and equitable calendar. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Kristen Stamathis. Good afternoon or good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and thank you for the time that you volunteer to serve on this board. I recognize that your jobs are probably not always easy in the decisions that you have to make, especially when it comes to the COVID protocols and this has to be challenging. Every decision you make greatly impacts our children and the families of Baltimore County Public Schools. I ask that you take a moment to reflect on the board's past COVID prevention decisions and the impacts of the well-being on our children and move forward with a fresh independent mindset for the next decision that is likely to come. Soon enough, you're gonna be asked if Baltimore County should mandate the new COVID-19 mRNA vaccine in our children. As you soon receive these federal agency recommendations, please remember my voice and the, patient and the face of parents who are concerned. I fully support any parent's choice in making a personal health care decision for their small child, and I support parents who choose to use this, as an inject, use this injection as extra protection as advertised. This is a virus that statistically does not harm the majority of young children. The COVID-19 vaccine, newly defined based on the mRNA technology, can't be categorized the same as other proven safe childhood immunizations that are currently required in public schools. This vaccine works differently. The data for impacts on this injection long-term are also simply not known. Families will need to make this, de this decision based on an analysis of risk versus benefit. And it's the parent's right to make this personal choice along with the pediatrician. This vaccine also does not stop the spread and therefore can't be used as a reason to mandate. I have two young children who are thriving at their public school. We have amazing teachers, a great principal, great staff, and they all fall under your authority. So I'm asking today to please consider to do the right thing and when and if this decision gets presented to you, please do not approve vaccine mandates. I also, that's my primary concern. My secondary and more important concern is trying to advocate to ask for compromise around our mask mandates. I have a kindergartner and a second grader and I finally had, was able to find a mask that was advertised as over 98% effective to keep out germs. Yet the Office of Health Services told me my child couldn't wear it because it simply was too breathable. When I looked at the CDC website, I could see that breathe, having a mask that's breathable is actually one of the recommendations they have. So I know this is a tough decision and you can't, obviously you don't have a lot of opinions, but please consider um, how we can find some compromise around the mask mandate so that the children can in fact have a healthy amount of um, breathing and you know a normal day. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And next we have Dr. Bash Farone. Madam Chair, may I have four minutes? <laughs> I do apologize, no. <laughs> I asked our honorable chair last meeting for four minutes, and she said three, just like today. It is about equality, and I agree. The current calendar, 22-23, is neither balanced nor inclusive. Students of culture look at the calendar and see the Komar holidays plus the two Jewish holidays, back to back. BCPS is ignoring all other minorities except for the Jewish minority. We are a diverse county. Dr. Hirston recognized that in his speech to the board in 2004 and 2005. This board believes in inclusion, equity, equality, but the calendar does not. It offers special favorite status to the Jewish faith over all other minorities. I am requesting that when Eid comes in on a weekend holiday is to make the day off a professional day on a Friday or a Monday adjacent to that. Eid al-Futr is three days and Eid al-Adha is four days. 
the county and state and the federal government already have the precedence. If July 4th comes on a Saturday, we are off on Monday. Martin Luther King, we close not on his birthday, exactly, and other similar holidays. It is about inclusion. It's about recognition. It is about our kids feeling that they are part of this country. To hold professional day on Rosh Hashanah and then nine days later to hold Yom Kippur is really not logical. And it's clearly a political benefit. I am requesting that BCPS includes all other minority religions and ethnicities holidays on the calendar. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, and the Chinese holidays, all of it needs to be on the calendar, which has been declined by the calendar committee. Teachers need to know these holidays, and they need to know what it means to their students. And it really costs you nothing, just ink on the calendar. I ask you that Jewish and Muslim holidays, two equals two, one equals one, and zero equals zero. That's only fair. I didn't get my four minutes. You got your three, thank you. Okay, that concludes our public comment. So the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And we have Ms. Charlie Green. There we are, right on time. So it will be Dr. Williams. Thank you, Ms. Charlie Green. Let me thank Ms. Charlie Green for filling in uh, for me this, this evening. So I'm here uh, to our board, to our board chair uh, and members of the board. I'm pleased to present my superintendent's report to the board and team BCPS. My report includes celebrations, operational updates, and evidence of our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence in action. My team and I will regularly update the board, our community, and Team BCPS during this time of change. Our partnership is critical to ensuring high-quality services to the student, staff, families of Baltimore County. Next slide. Thank you. As part of our continued efforts to recover, rebuild, and heal, we must acknowledge our current state have frank dialogue about our paths forward and collaboratively create the climate and conditions necessary for collective healing. My team and I continue to meet with principals, visit schools, speak with staff, and engage with union presidents and executive directors through weekly check-ins and monthly sessions. We also look forward to future opportunities to engage with the community. Our goal is to demonstrate our commitment to supporting schools in a responsive, collaborative, and differentiated manner. Updates included in this evening's report will include evidence of these commitments. Next slide. So congratulations. Another good news. Team BCPS joins the entire state 
in congratulating Mr. Brad Fisher, Administrative Secretary at Shady Spring Elementary School, on being named the 2021-2022 Maryland State Education Association, MSEA, Education Support Professional of the Year. Mr. Fisher represents not only the best of Baltimore County's support professionals, but the best of Maryland's ESPs. And we're so proud of him. In highlighting his excellence, we hope to bring attention to education support professionals throughout the school system. They play a key role in the operations of our schools and the lives of our students. And Mr. Fisher exemplifies the impact that they can have. So a little bit about Mr. Fisher. He joined BCPS in 2012 at Elmwood Elementary School. He served as an adult assistant, paraeducator, and office secretary. He moved into his current role as administrative secretary at Shady Spring Elementary School in 2018. In May 2021, Mr. Fisher was named the 2021 BCPS Office Professional of the Year. Mr. Fisher said he was humbled by the honor. In addition to thanking his school community, family, and friends, he thanked Jeanette Young, President of Education Support Professionals of Baltimore County, ESPBC, and Celeste Harris, Director of Teachers Association of Baltimore County, TAPCO, ESPBC Uniserve, for nominating him for the statewide honor and for their continued trust in seeking his input into policy. In addition, he said, it is the S in ESP that I like to speak about today. Without question, we do what we do in the best interest of children to support our students in gaining the knowledge and social emotional skills necessary to solve problems of the world that we haven't yet. All of you build those same important relationships because that's what our students need supplementing academics with culture to groom well-rounded human beings. So congratulations, Mr. Brad Fisher and the Shady Spring Elementary School community. Next slide. Baltimore County Public Schools dedicates American Education Week of 2021, November 15th through the 19th to celebrating educational heroes which includes everyone who supports students' academic and social-emotional growth. While we're not able to host school visits this year, we're looking forward to a number of virtual offerings from Parent University and Curriculum and Instruction. A full list can be found on our website. During this week, we will recognize National Education Support Professionals on November 17th. I know you will join me in ensuring that our ESPs know how vital they are to Team BCPS and how much we appreciate their support and dedication. On November 19th, we will recognize Substitute Educators Day. This year, more than ever, we rely on our substitutes to help ensure high quality learning environments for our students. The school system will encourage Team BCPS members to celebrate their school and share on social media favorite learning learning memories, messages of appreciation, and updates on what students are learning. The hashtag for the week will be hashtag BCPSAEW. Next slide. Preparing our students for the opportunity to pursue higher education is a daily part of our work in BCPS. On Friday, November 5th, Team BCPS celebrated the first of two BCPS college days this school year. I hope you enjoy the photos of students, staff, and community members shared on social media using hashtag BCPS College Day. With all of this happening in the world, college attendance has declined nationally. Data from the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center in June of 2021 showed that the spring of 2021 undergraduate college enrollment dropped by 4.9% from spring of 2020. This was the largest overall decline in college enrollment since 2011. Community colleges experienced the largest decline at 9.5%. We will continue to use our college day and other opportunities, events, and initiatives throughout the year 
to remind our students that college is within reach and remains important for promoting intellectual and personal growth and raising earnings potential. One upcoming opportunity is the fifth annual BCPS HBCU Virtual College Fair that will take place on Thursday, November 11th from 4 to 7 p.m. Next slide. During the week of November 8th through 12th, schools throughout the United States are celebrating National School Psychology Week to highlight the important work school psychologists and other educators do to help all students thrive. This year's theme is Let's Get In Gear. The theme's acronym provides a challenge to grow both personally and professionally. It encourages us to engage in best practices and advocate for children's access to mental health and learning supports. To rise implies resilience and renewal despite the challenges of the past. So thank you to our hardworking school psychologists. Next slide. In order to engage in effective progress monitoring, we need to know where we are. We are excited about our new power school tools and we'll spend time over the next few months building our organizational capacity to assess and analyze data in real time. Performance Matters and the Cognos Performance Dashboard will provide us with leading data to help inform real time instructional decisions in classrooms, courses and schools across the district. The data will help us to ask questions and provide support. We should use data as a flashlight and not a hammer. Working together, leadership teams can identify and illuminate areas of growth, concerns to ask the right questions and arrive at answers that benefit students. Schools are not in this alone. As school staff engage in this work, central office partners are committed to providing support. We're counting on schools to be frank about that, what works, what's missing, and what can be used innovatively to address a students' needs. More information regarding our current student progress will be shared at a future meeting. Next slide. So I'm pleased to report that more than 98% of staff in Team BCPS have responded to the vaccination mandate. 89% of the respondents have submitted proof of full vaccination. Weekly staff testing is in place. As you know, winter student athletes are required to be vaccinated or participate in weekly testing beginning November 24th. Additional information will be shared with Team BCPS soon. And we are excited that many families are already taking advantage of the availability of COVID-19 vaccine offered for children ages 5 to 11. We look forward to working with the health departments to create school-based options for families. Next slide. On Wednesday, November 3rd, we hosted our second Principals Leadership Development Opportunities for School and System Leaders. I want to thank Ms. Mack and Ms. Pastor for being present. The training center on the four priority areas listed here, grounded in the compass, these key areas represent our focus for the year. Social emotional wellness for staff and students, accelerated learning for student progress, increasing data literacy to support our efforts, and collectively committing to a standard of excellence. A year-long plan provides monthly professional learning opportunities for all members of Team BCPS as shown on this slide. Principals personalize school-based plans that include paraprofessionals, teachers, and staff. Schools also create parallel structures to inform, involve, and support families. We encourage our, our school leaders to keep parents, guardians, and community informed as we work together to support our students. School systems across the nation are grappling with fostering safe and supportive learning environments in light of the myriad of challenges our students and families face related to the pandemic. School districts are struggling with behavior issues as students return to school buildings after more than 18 months in virtual learning. In October, we held our virtual town hall where we shared our proactive approach to addressing anticipated behaviors. We're looking forward to hosting additional meetings by zone and convening principal focus groups and our system 
improvement team meetings on suspensions to collaboratively problem solve and identify additional resources. We will work with our student leaders and parent representatives to gain their perspective on creating and maintaining safe and supportive environments. Recognizing that this is a year like no other, our goal is to monitor our data, support schools, and look forward to improvement. I meet monthly for one-on-one -on -one meetings with our union presidents and executive director. In addition to our joint union president executive directors meeting, members of my cabinet meet weekly with union presidents to share and resolve problems and concerns. Union leadership is included in each stage of the efficiency review implementation process to ensure open communication and collaboration in support of Team BCPS. Tonight, I want to provide a brief update on our shared commitments. As you know, I have committed to a full review of all salary schedules. That work is being led by our manager of staff relations in collaboration with unions and staff representatives. Related to payroll certification and benefits, our team was provided with a database of about 400 remaining specific questions and concerns. Staff are currently reviewing the list and will provide regular updates to our unions regarding progress. Our goal is to research, resolve, and respond to the identified staff concerns as soon as possible. As you have heard me announce time and time, our human resources team is working tirelessly to create opportunities to attract and hire additional staff as pictured on this slide. BCPS provided paid opportunities during the pandemic to keep more than 500 substitutes in active status, and we continue to accept applicants to serve in this critical role. We have hired 300 additional substitute teachers since July 1 of 2021. 368 long-term subs have been placed at our schools. Central office staff who are available and able will have the opportunity to volunteer in schools for a variety of tasks, including class coverage, bus duty, and lunch duty to help mitigate staffing shortages. Our team has worked with the county executive's office to remove pre-employment barriers for bus attendants and, and operators. Our unions have reported that the state of, of Maryland is looking into onboarding timelines across the state. We hope to have more information soon. We're exploring additional opportunities to streamline onboarding across unions while remaining in compliance with the law and supporting our staff members who are manually processing and certifying data as we continue to rebuild. So I appreciate the advocacy and continued partnership of our union leadership. We're all part of Team BCPS and I look forward to working together to ensure the success of our system. And in collaboration with the county executive and with the support of this board, today we announce a plan to boost recruitment and retention of school bus drivers amid a national wide shortage. In addition to the county's plan to remove pre-employment barriers for new hires, BCPS will provide recruitment and retention incentives to all ASHME, that's American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees, including bus drivers. These incentives include a $250 sign-on bonus, a $250 employee referral incentive, $50 monthly attendance reward for on-time attendance every day, retention bonus of up to $1,000 to be paid in December and June, and the use of urgent personal leave during winter and or spring break. Additionally, bus drivers have been taken on additional routes, at times doubling and tripling back during their stand by time. In recognition of this additional work, BCPS will provide drivers with shift differential pay of $2 per hour for the remaining of the school year. So we, wanna, we want to thank our employees for their tireless efforts on behalf of our students and families. It is our hope that these steps are, that we're taking today as a system will help us provide greater support and recognition of our employees and build a stronger Team BCPS. While today's announcement is mainly focused on incentives and new initiatives to support Ashby, BCPS is also pleased to share work is underway in partnership with all union presidents and executive directors to finalize additional compensation, recognition, and opportunities to focus on staff well-being for other members of Team BCPS. 
This is in addition to the 2% increase effective January 1 for TAPCO case, OPE and ASHME, and a 3.5% increase that was effective July 1 for ESPBC. One of the ways that we are creating brain or SEL breaks for staff is through remote work options and flexibility whenever possible. We understand these decisions don't have the same impact across all unions. To ensure that the resulting benefit is valued, we have solicited feedback and are tailoring our efforts to be responsive. So I look forward to, uh, to sharing those results of our conversations in the near future. So we will continue to update the board. Last slide. Our community and team BCPS during these challenging times. Our partnership is critical to ensuring a safe and successful year for all of our students. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And it looks like next is um, the, let's see. The next item on the agenda is the chair's report. It's my report. So um, I once again have a very short video for that. Yep, so um, is that ready? Okay, so it'll just play. Thank you. I don't think there's any sound yet. Team BCPS. I am Makita Scott, the chair of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Now that fall and cooler weather have arrived, it feels as though we are finally starting to enjoy old routines and getting into the rhythm of the school year. That includes a number of meaningful events across the county where we were able to celebrate the ongoing work of Team BCPS. This fall, we were finally able to cut the ribbon on three new replacement school projects at Berkshire Elementary School in Dundalk, Chadwick Elementary in Woodlawn, and today at Colgate Elementary School in southeastern Baltimore County. Each one of these original schools have served their communities well. In Colgate's case, since 1924, due to growing enrollment, and the need for more modern up-to-date learning areas, new schools were approved and have become showcases in their neighborhoods. The ribbon cuttings also represent the culmination of much vision and hard work from so many stakeholders. From the board, whose vision allows the projects to move forward, to our business and elected partners who support and fund these buildings. Baltimore County school officials and board members were also honored to be a part of the recent dedication of a Unity Playground at Gunpowder Elementary School in Perry Hall. The playground was dedicated to the memory and service of Baltimore County Police Officer Amy Caprio. I would also like to recognize November as National Native American Heritage Month, which dates its origins back to the first American Indian Day celebrated in May 1916 in New York. As I said, it has been a busy few weeks, one that finds BCPS on the move once again. Thanks for joining us for this edition of From the Chairwoman's Corner. We'll see you next time. Thank you. And I would like to thank, I wanted to um, really make sure that I wanted to thank uh, board members because we're here and we do a lot of work and it's really nice when you can go out in the field, in the community, to the schools and actually um, see it happen. And a lot of board members, as you saw, um, have been out or in videos and really um, supporting the, the work that we do. So I wanted to, to make sure I um, um, thanked everybody for that. Very much appreciated. So our next um, item on the agenda is the student member of the board's report. And for that, we call on Mr. Thomas. 
Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Superintendent Williams, board members, the public. Evening, sorry, and students of VCPS. I want to start off by thanking the students and staff at the following schools. Rosedale Center, Overly High School, the new Berkshire Elementary School, Chesapeake Terrace Elementary School, Sparrows Point Middle School, Sparrows Point High School, Sussex Elementary School, Fullerton Elementary School, Shady Spring Elementary School, Chesapeake High School, Towson High School, West Towson Elementary School, Lock Raven High School, and Colgate Elementary School for welcoming me into your schools this past month. It has been an honor to visit the students around our county and get to witness not only the learning in action, but the innovation and resilience that exists within our county this year. I also want to thank our tremendous community superintendents and executive directors for attending these visits with me. In each of these schools, I've had the opportunity to meet with our incredible students, from concerns pertaining to food and nutrition with elementary school kids, the impacts of peer pressure and poor behavior in our middle schools, and the ways we can better prepare our students for the future in high school with magnet programs, extracurricular activities focusing on inclusivity, and greater opportunities for specialized courses, as well as the importance of accessing extracurricular activities, the need for more world languages, and so, so much more. I've been able to hear from our students and get an understanding of what we really need in BCPS. Going to these schools, I get to see the true diversity of our system. And that includes students from all walks of life, from all races and creeds and faiths. And this, that diversity in BCPS reminds me of our calendar conversation tonight. The debate over starting the school year before or after Labor Day, this debate has everything to do with everyone else and not the students in BCPS. It deals with the state fair, it relates to Ocean City, it talks about vacations, but what the focus isn't on is our students. The focus isn't on the fact that our national AP exam dates are set far in advance and won't change. It isn't on the SAT dates and the PSAT dates that are earlier in the year that we need those extra weeks to prepare for. And the focus surely isn't on that diversity in BCPS. It isn't on the students who recognize Diwali, a holiday in which our Hindu students have long had to either sacrifice their ability to remain up to date and engaged in classroom curricula or their right to celebrate their holiday with their families. And our debate isn't including recognition of our Asian and Asian American students who are forced to do the same with the Lunar New Year each and every year. And again, to our Muslim students who can't recognize Eid al-Fitr without having to not only make up assignments, but do so at the very end of our school year. Do you know a message this sends to our students? Because I do. And I've been learning about it from them at each of these visits. I've been learning about it from our students tonight. Michelle Wong, who wrote literature petitioning us as board members to recognize more holidays. From Roa Hassan, who organized email templates to send to all of us, advocating for more inclusive calendars. So this debate about whether or not to add a week before or at the end of the school year, that's not what our students really want to focus on. We're going to still get those 180 school days. What's really important is addressing our faith-based faith holidays and promising to recognize our students that aren't only of Jewish and Christian faith. Tonight, when we go into our calendar discussion, we need to talk about adopting a more inclusive calendar, not just talking about before or after Labor Day. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Brusades. Good evening. Uh, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session and voted to approve a memorandum of understanding with AFSME. Now would be an appropriate time for the board to confirm that vote. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So, so moved. moved. Mac. Second, Mac. Is there a second? Yes. Thank you. But it was Ms. Mack, and it was moved by Ms. Hen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Williams, will that memo of uh, understanding be posted to board docs now that it's public? on this agenda? Uh, we can make that arrangement, yes. Like we normally do when we have memorandums of understanding, we do make that public. Thank you. 
Any additional discussion or questions? No? Okay. Ms. Scover, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. I'm sorry, Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that, I call on Ms. Jost, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Good evening. Um, the Building and Contracts Committee met yesterday, November 8th, uh, to review contracts K-1 through K-10. The committee unanimously approved all 10 contracts. In addition, the weekly update, uh, staff has provided many details on contract K-1, Modification Assistive Technology, and K-5, Workforce Management System, which answers a lot of questions. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Do I have a motion to approve items K-1 through K-10? So move 10. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in the um, discussion relating to the contract for the Kurzweil, um, it was stated that the Kurzweil is an MSDE approved tool. And in a previous um, board meeting and discussion, the question was asked about an MSDE um, approved list of instructional materials or tools. And um, the answer was that they would have to check into it. So I'd just like a little more clarification around uh, the MSDE approved tools list. Is it something that MSDE has on their website? Is it something where we request information from MSCE. Can you answer that, Dr. Williams? Or so will we have I will ask one of the staff members um, to respond to that. So we have Dr. Elmendorf and Mr. Corns. Okay. So the question was about, you, got you heard the question. Okay. Good evening, thank you for the uh, opportunity. Uh, so MSDE um, approves that we use um, Kurzweil when we, when we do state testing, but it's not part of a list per se. So that's something that, but, as you're exploring options, you uh, request approval from MSDE. In conversations with our um, with MSDE, they've indicated that, that Kurzweil for years now has one that they approve that we use for um, accommodations when we do testing. Okay, is their approval required or it's something that um, you're seeking more for collaboration and um, perspective of other districts and that sort of thing? So Mrs. Causey, the Kurzweil is the only approved reader uh, for the longest time for the M MSDE state assessments like the MCAP and the HSA and the MSA. Uh, so it is a, 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 a purpose-built specified approval that comes through the Office of Special Ed at the at MSDE's level for Kurzweil itself. Thank you. And I'm not questioning the decision to oh. to implement Kurzweil. Sure. Um, I'm just trying to understand the process. No, absolutely. That's that's the the reason why Kurzweil comes with an MSDE approval it is one of the few softwares that they actually endorse for use in this nature. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the 2022-2023 school calendar. And for that, I call on Mr. Duke.
Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I'm here this evening to seek the board's consideration and approval of one of the calendar options presented to the board for the 2022-2023 school year. Uh, I must uh, advise the board, however, that uh, in reviewing the calendars that were presented to the board, um, the uh, November 8th uh, election day in 2022 was omitted from the calendar, and this would uh, impact the calendar by reducing the total number of days by one, or the other option is to extend and add an additional day to make up for the shortage. And I apologize for that oversight. Do I have a motion to approve the pre or post Labor Day 2022 through 2023 school calendar as presented in Exhibit L? I'm sorry, excuse me, I read that wrong. Do I have a motion to approve the pre Labor Day 2022 to 2023 school calendar as presented in Exhibit L? So moved, Hager. Do I have a second? Second, Thomas. Thank you. Any discussion? This is for the pre-Labor Day. Yeah, pre-Labor Day. So, um, yes, we have Mr. Thomas and Dr. Hager and then Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Uh, so I, I am in fully in support of the pre-Labor Day start to the school year. Uh, I can definitely say this wasn't an easy decision to kind of come to think about. Uh, it took a lot of conversations with students and learning about this, but if we think about uh, our, our tests that we have as students, our AP test dates, those are in May, for the first two weeks of May, and they're gonna be at the first two weeks of May for every single year. I think that by adding a year to the end of the school year, it's kind of redundant. We're kind of done with the school year towards the end of the year, and we aren't gonna be focused on our classes. But allowing us to have that week in the beginning of the year to prepare for our AP exams, is more beneficial than having it at the end of the year. I also believe that um, there are, or I know that there are some schools around the county or some school systems that are starting the school year at the mid-August, in the beginning of August. And that means that they have weeks, uh, almost a month, more to prepare than Baltimore County students do for these exams. And that's kind of the decision that I, I'm standing by on behalf of the students and on behalf of uh, what we prepare our students for the most success. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, sure, and I, I made some similar comments last year with respect to pre-Labor Day, but as a parent in a dual parent working household who lived through the post-Labor Day years um, with small children, I would consistently be at a loss for finding camps at the end of summer. Kids go back to college, college kids staff camps. Colleges end mid-May, early May, and so consistently I would make my spreadsheet <laughs> that I made every summer to figure out where my kids were gonna go. And I would think to myself, what would I do if I didn't have the resources and the family that I have locally? And most of our families don't have that privilege that I had. And that is honestly one of the reasons that I, I, I even considered putting my hat in the ring for the board because I see this as a huge equity issue. And we, we need to think about the families that, that don't have those resources at the end of the summer when camps don't exist and they just simply aren't available. And so that is, that's really my, my reason that I'm very, very pre-Labor Day. Um, again, I think of it as an equity issue. And also our teachers are in the same boat. If we're expecting our teachers to come back a week before the school year starts, there aren't gonna be camps for their kids either. And so um, again, having lived through it, I can, I can testify to say that it's really very challenging. And so shifting it, uh, so that we get out earlier in June when there are camps available is a big deal and that's part of the that way. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rowe. So a lot of this debate about the pre-Labor Day versus um, post-Labor Day is comes across as just a perspective, but what it's really about is avoiding a slow creep into lengthening the school year until it eventually evolves into year-round school, which in a state that has a lot of agriculture and summer tourism that funds a lot of the economic engine of our state and a lot of children who participate in agriculture and summer jobs and a lot of different things that are part of the culture of our state, I think it's important that we not creep into year-round 
and the board was sent a calendar by Mr. Friedman and I'll be voting against this motion so that I can make a motion in favor of Mr. Friedman's calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Smack. Mr. Duke, I'd just like to, for you to clarify what your comment was. With November 8th being, being added to the calendar, does that make the end date on the pre-Labor Day June 9th and the end date on the post-Labor Day, um, hold on, June 16th? Um, it would cause us to go ahead and either extend the calendar by a day, um, which would then impact the, uh, the last day um, that's currently showing on the calendar, or just contract it by a day because we would still wind up with 185 elementary school days and 186 secondary days. So we would not necessarily have to change the end date is what you're saying? We would not, by adding a day, however, it would always give us an additional um, buffer, uh, additional day uh, of, in, of instruction as well as additional hours. Uh, we have to be cognizant of two things. We have to meet the requirements uh, for the um, minimum number of student days, right. which is 180, and we also have to meet um, the requisite uh, 1,080 hours, contact hours for elementary middle schools and 1,170 contact hours for high school students. Um, okay. okay, and that applies to either the post, pre or post Labor Day calendar? Correct, we would have to abide by those requirements. Um, just as an information, um, I believe the question was raised, and I think you may have asked the question, about how many of our sister jurisdictions do pre and how many do post. Um, there are eight jurisdictions with post Labor Day starts for this school year. Uh, many of them have not even addressed the 22-23 school year. So I'm basing it on what they did for this school year and 16 with pre Labor Day starts. Okay, thank you for answering my question and thank you for that additional information. Thank you. Next is Ms. Pastor. Thank you. Uh, I just want to throw in one thing that no one has discussed, um, and that has to do with uh, opening pre. Remember, when we open pre, teachers come back the week before school opens. And I'm speaking as Ms. Ha Dr. Hager did about equity. And whether people agree or disagree, and as Mr. Thomas said, the debate is pre or post. However, we do have an enorm enormous number of teachers. Well, in fact, all of our teachers, 10-month and all other 10-month people who rely on what they do during the summer. And every day counts, every paycheck counts, and all of those things we need to take into consideration uh, as well, because that's about equity for our teachers, making sure they can work as long as they can to supplement the salary that they are working with as 10-month people since they don't get paid during the summer. Many of our students, whether they are athletes or otherwise, or in the building, on the grounds, et cetera, are working because they have to, not because they want to. So while some people have the leisure to talk about camps and whatever else they have, they have going on in the summer, some students don't, many of our students don't get to do that because they are working and they need every day that they can work, they need every opportunity they can. So teachers and students who are in that situation are trying to make all of their ends meet, for some of us who've forgotten what that means, are trying to make their ends meet until they get back into the schools for the teachers and get that regular paycheck. And some of our folks are still trying to bridge the gap from uh, the pandemic. That's time. Thank you, and I'm done. Thank you. Um, next is Ms. Causey. Thank you. Mr. Duke, we were sent an email by um, 
Ms. Donna Sibley, the coordinator of the uh, Area Education Advisory Councils, and she had a number of comments related to the calendar committee and clarifications from questions from the last meeting. So, Dr. Williams, I wonder if staff is prepared to address those. Mr. Duke, are you prepared to address these questions that Ms. Causey has referenced? It depends on the questions. Thank you. Are you intending to ask the questions? Um, I thought it was forwarded to Dr. Williams and staff. So are you going to ask the questions or are they supposed to already know what the questions are that you're referencing? My understanding was they received this email. I don't want to use my time on the questions that were emailed. Okay. So what is your question? Please continue. I... Okay. Are you finished? No, I'm. Okay. I'm Go ahead then. The... Please continue. Okay. Ms. Um, Excuse me, Ms. Scott, I am finding my place on the page. Excuse if, me? If, if you want to move to someone else. That's what I'll I'm write. asking. I, I, I just, I'm confused. Are you finished? I'm or? yielding my time to the next person asking a question. Okay, well, <laughs> we don't yield time, but all right. Does anyone else have any other questions? Yes, Mr. McMillian. Mr. Duke, when you said those numbers, six pre and no eight pre and 16 post 16 pre labor day and eight post labor day okay so i got that mixed up so so we're talking about the 23 counties and the state of maryland plus baltimore city that's the 24 four okay thank you thank you yes miss jose thank you miss scott uh mr duke to um say to piggyback off what Ms. Pass George said, if the teachers were to come back two weeks early in August, they would be paid then from August all the way up to the end of June? Correct. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a bigger issue that we should pay our teachers better that they don't have to do two jobs, but that's besides the point. I digress. Um, there were many teachers that supported the pre-Labor Day uh, start date um, with the reasoning that the studies have shown that students get engaged earlier, much more quickly, and there are services that public schools provide, like food and nutrition and education. We are the Board of Education that only the schools can provide. So um, there is a question of equity. And like our SMOP so eloquently um, stated, everyone is concerned about vacations, camps, and state fairs. But not all of our students can afford vacations and camps. Um, so we are here to serve our children, and we should be inclusive. So my question is, if we were to add those holidays, um, all the religious holidays, would that extend if we were to go post Labor Day, it would go all the way up to the end of June? Um, if those days were added as professional development days, similar to what we do currently with the, the Muslim and the um, Jewish holidays, so they would be uh, non-attendance days for students, uh, we would have to make up those days. And we also have to be cognizant of the contractual number of teacher days. We cannot exceed 191 days. So there is a potential, depending on the number of days that the board considers to add to the calendar and make them professional development days, um, that would have to be mapped out and we would have to calculate what the impact of the, of observing all of those days as professional development days, what that impact would have on, on student days and hours, as well as the contractual teacher days. So regardless of whether the board approves post or pre, that would impact your number of days that you'd have to calculate and make sure we are in compliance? Yeah, Correct. I would have to go ahead and, and take a look at it. I'm more concerned, I think, uh, with the... Um, teacher contractual days because teachers are on duty during those days. So the kids are out, but the teachers are on duty. So that counts as a contractual teacher day. So if, if we have uh, a lot of days in which the students are out, but the teachers are in, then that impacts the contractual 191 days. And if we exceed that, then we have to pay our teachers. So if we were to give the teachers a holiday, that would then extend the 191 days that contractually we're obligated to. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Duke. Yes, Mr. Kuhn. Um, Mr. Dukes, the um, MSCA convention day that is in October on the 21st, we have contractually agreed to provide that day off for teachers. I mean, I, I know it's a, a professional day, correct? Correct. It's a professional um, development day uh, in those teachers that um, and paraeducators, mm -hmm. uh, ESPBCs, okay. not just paraeducators, but uh, ESPBC um, represented employees can take advantage of that day to either participate in professional development on site or off site, as well as uh, attend the MSEA conference, uh, which in the past has been held in Ocean City. Um, so they do have that option. Not all teachers attend, not all ESPBCs attend, but those that want to are given the opportunity to do so. So my question is that day counts against our 191 day limit, correct? It is a non-student day, so that does not count as a student day. So yes, and then also it is a teacher duty day. Right. So it, it counts towards a, a the teacher. The 191 limit, correct. Right. Okay, so um, are we contractually obligated with the current uh, TABCO agreement to provide that day in the form it's in? There is nothing in the contract. It has been a long-standing practice and understanding between the school system and the, um, and the union, uh, unions, TABCO and ESPBC, uh, that that day has been given um, as an opportunity for them to participate in, in union-sponsored professional development or school-based, system-based professional development. Okay, thank you. I, I would suggest that um, <clears throat> if we are concerned about the 191 day limit and if we're gonna go down the road of looking at expanding holidays, that we take a close look at this day because um, this in, es in essence is a union activity and the convention I believe goes through the weekend and I don't quite agree with it impacting our students learning uh, the same way as a religious holiday does. Uh, so I, I'm just making that comment because I think that with the pressures that we're hearing tonight and that we have heard over time, people are looking for change and I see this as an opportunity to make a change. So um, I just make that as a suggestion. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, Mr. Duke, do you know how many of the 191 days we're currently fulfilling? We, we build the calendar so that teachers are on duty 191 days. Okay, so they are on duty 191 days, and that's the maximum, correct? That's the maximum, correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Or, yes, Ms. Causey? I wanted to ask a question of Mr. Thomas in terms of this calendar. Uh, how he feels that it uh, does more for the holidays, the pre versus the post, to recognize the diversity of our school system. You can answer. Thank you. I, I don't necessarily feel that the pre or post Labor Day debate actually influences the holidays. I think that if we do post Labor Day, then uh, we have to recognize Juneteenth as a day off. Currently, it's not like listed as a day off on one of our federal holidays. So it would extend the school year even beyond June 19th in the next school year. So we'd go into, if we have snow days, uh, June 22nd, 23rd, 24th, continuing. That wouldn't really relate to, uh, oh, sorry. I didn't, if I said something wrong, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say something incorrect. Okay. But, <laughs> I, I don't think it would necessarily relate to the religious holidays. I think with either calendar, we can uh, put in PD days to uh, account for the religious holidays um, and and not uh, put, put in PD days. I don't think it would really relate to either pre or post Labor Day. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to make a comment around June 19th, um, or Juneteenth rather. Um, it is a federal holiday. However, not all federal holidays are uh, public school holidays. Um, it does not preclude the board from adding um, it to the holiday schedules observed by BCPS. 
However, the fact that it's simply a federal holiday does not imply that it is a closure day for public schools. If you will um, recall Veterans Day, which is the federal holiday, as well as um, vet, uh, Veterans Day, um, both of those days are federal holidays and uh, they are not observed by um, public school system. Thank you. Uh, but if we were to designate Juneteenth as a school closure, and that would extend the year, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. We received an email from Donna Sibley, the um, Area Education Advisory Council, and she said that uh, when discuss when, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there was concern that some of the answers provided to the board um, asked by uh, various board members were incomplete. Um, and one of those issues related to the virtual learning um, and the state fair and also students working to Ms. Pasture's point. Um, could you address Mr. Thomas's point about the religious holidays being changed to professional development, that that would need to be done now or else we would need to postpone this vote to do that work of evaluating that? Well, that would be at your discretion, the board's discretion as to what they, how they would like to go ahead and proceed and which days they would choose to go ahead and consider uh, acknowledging as professional development days or giving that acknowledgement to those days as professional development days. And yes, I think it would be behoove us to go ahead and scrutinize the calendar and see what impact that those days would have, uh, as I said, on the contractual 191 days as well as the student days in meeting the requirements um, established by the state. Any additional questions? Yes, Ms. Mack. Mr. Duke, to the point that you just made, we would not be precluded, though, tonight on voting for a pre- or post-Labor Day calendar because the issues that you described, needing to evaluate the 191 days and other impacts of adding religious holidays, um, is a separate effort, whether it's pre or post Labor Day. Is that a true statement? I think I think the board has um, has a decision to make, as I made uh, earlier. Um, what the calendar committee recommended was that whichever calendar the board contemplates on approving, either be it post or pre, um, that it uh, also uh, make a decision relative to consistency meaning that moving forward, it would always be a pre-Labor Day start or moving forward, it would always be a post-Labor Day start. So if you work from that perspective, um, then if you make a decision as to a pre or a post, then we need to go ahead and determine one, which days the board is recommending that be observed uh, as professional development days on the calendar and then taking into account those number of days, um, reassess the impact that it has on student hours, student contact days, contract, uh, teacher contract days, and then see how it plays out on the uh, calendar uh, and determine when the last day of school is and, and all the other things that um, have to be taken into consideration when developing the school year calendar. I guess where I'm struggling is a vote that we take would be binding. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me like without the evaluation done by you and your team, we really don't have enough information to know what the impact of making any significant changes like that to the pre or post Labor Day started. A am I correct? Yeah, I think your observation is correct and valid. So what is the impact to you and your team and the negotiations with the bargaining units for delaying this vote? Uh, it just, it, it basically is just uh, delaying it um, uh, until we can go ahead and make an, uh, an assessment and map out. Um, once you provide us with the information as to which days you want us to go ahead and, and include, 
uh, as observances and converting them to professional development days. Um, it would just delay it, uh, the board's decision, and it would impact the community because obviously the community is expecting a calendar um, vote this evening, and obviously if you delay it, um, it will impact on them having the information. I guess what I'm personally struggling with is do I have enough information to know what it looks like because I don't want to violate the 191 day issue. Um, May I be frank? Yes, please. Um, I, I would be very uncomfortable um, having a calendar approved this evening, um, not knowing which days are being contemplated as days uh, that the board will be asking um, us to incorporate. Um, and I would feel more comfortable with being able to make a, 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 an informed um, decision as well as being able to go ahead and map out the calendar for, um, for the board's consideration. Okay, thank you. Yes, next is Ms. Pastor. Thank you. I agree with um, what uh, Mr. Duke said. I what? It's on. Ms. Pastor's time is Oh, okay. Well, didn't his elapse? Oh, that was time. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Thomas. So I have a question. Then uh, should we withdraw the motion for the pre-Labor Day uh, calendar and make a motion to uh, recognize certain PD days, um, and then have the team review those, and then we can come back at the next meeting and discuss the calendar with the PD days on the after your team assesses that. Would that be an? Would you think that would be an appropriate way to move forward? To with I'm sorry to withdraw the motion. Yes, and then make a motion to have the team come back with additional professional. No. We would make a motion about the PD days that would be recognized, uh, the religious holidays, and then ask that at the next board meeting we be presented with those PD days on the calendar. Um, um, I guess I would ask Mr. Mercedes, would that require a motion? I don't know to withdraw the motion, but couldn't we just direct? Um, Mr. Sarah or the um, superintendent to come back to us with our requested um, PD days. What I'm hearing is that it sounds like there's some interest in having Mr. Duke look at certain uh, religious holidays as PD days. So maybe the board would just need to decide which days they want to be uh, looked at in particular. Mm -hmm. that Okay, and would that require a motion, or would we direct Mr. Saris to do that um, and then have that presented at the next board meeting? I think a motion uh, would, be would be appropriate. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you cut into your time, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So then we would have to withdraw the a motion on the floor now to mm -hmm. move forward. Okay. Yes, because we have the motion on the floor before Madam we can do anything else. Um, I'm sorry, though, but um, was there any other question or discussion so around the motion on the floor? A point of order. We can't withdraw a motion. I believe it would be a motion to table pending information from Mr. Duke because we either have to process the motion or we have to table it or we have to postpone it, but we can't withdraw a motion. Is that... So here's what I'm hearing is that I think um, we want to postpone it, I'm thinking, until the next meeting. I believe tabling it just tables it, but if we postpone it, I believe we would have to pick it up then at the next meeting. Is that correct, Mr. Mercedes? Yes. Okay. So we want to make sure we use the right terminology. Thank you, Ms. Ann. So it would be postponing it, and then um, it would come back to us at the next meeting. The motion, yes. Okay. Yes, move to so postpone the somebody has the to floor. make a, sorry, I interrupted you, please go ahead. I said I move to postpone the motion on the floor to the next meeting. Second, Thomas. I'm sorry, I had my hand up to ask a question before she made the motion. So if I can still ask my question, that's fine. You but. can still ask your question, okay. yes. Ms. So the motion was made to postpone um, the calendar until the next meeting. It was seconded by Mr. Thomas. Um, discussion, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, in the efficiency review, it says uh, that 
the survey results show that teacher morale is not good with over 6,000 comments submitted. Um, to Mr. Thomas's point about the pre or post Labor Day start, when we receive emails from teachers that say that it is about morale, the pre or post start, um, I also believe it's morale has to do with being heard. You talked about student voice being heard. Our other students talked about their voices being heard. Um, has any survey been done by the school system to the teachers and other staff uh, and or parents to request their specific input on a pre or post Labor Day start or any other factor about the calendars? The last time that this uh, issue uh, arose, uh, I believe TAPCO uh, did a survey of its membership. Um, there was no, no survey done around the 22-23 calendar and whether a pre or a post was preferred. However, a few years ago, um, TABCO did do a survey and um, its membership indicated that it was in favor of a pre-Labor Day start. Um, I would like to make an amendment to the motion on the floor to have BCPS do a survey to the employees. Well, because point of order, that's not point the of motion on the floor. Yeah. Point of order, we have to, we have to vote on the motion, on the motion to, to postpone, postpone that's on the floor. Okay, so I <laughs> withdraw my amendment that's not allowed. Um, if we pass the motion that's on the floor, can we continue discussion to see what board members would like to have information brought to us? So I'm not sure how this is productive. Um, I think that we need to process the motion and um, decide what holidays we want to look at as PD and then move forward with our agenda because I think we're c going down a rabbit hole. So and after we pass the So I think that we need to go ahead and do that. Do you have any questions specifically about um, postponing this? Because after we postpone it, you still want to have discussion about what board members want to see? Yes, that's correct. I think we've already we've already had that we've already had that discussion, Ms. Causey. So I haven't it's time that part to of the it's time to morale, to so move on. Can I get what up? teacher morale? What helps teacher morale is a board that functions and works together and actually gets things done and doesn't sit and go back and forth. And that's what we are attempting to do. That's so if I'm we could move forward, also. so I'm that we can process this, an that question. would be great. Did you have a comment, Ms. Hen? Thank you. Only that we will be moving forward to, I think, the point Mrs. Causey is trying to get to with our next motion if someone makes it, which is the, um, the, how, the professional development days that the board would like to consider adding. That okay. is a subsequent motion, not the motion on the floor. So with that, I would like to see us move forward and vote on that, Madam Chair. Yes. Thank you. That would be great. So let's move forward with the postponement was made by Ms. Rowe seconded by Mr. Thomas, and um, it would postpone this until our next meeting, which is November 23rd. Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So still on this, um, there was a question, I believe, Mr. Thomas that first. Mr. Thomas had. Yes. Thank you. I move to have Mr. Duke uh, work with his team to recognize uh, Diwali, Lunar New Year, and Eid al Fitr as professional development days on the calendar. And for those dates that fall on weekends to consider recognizing Fridays or Mondays on those weekends as the professional development days. Second Thank you. Second, Causey. Can, can you just repeat? Yes. yes. Did you um, email that to me so that I can um, repeat that, Mr. Thomas? Ye um, Cause we yes, didn't. I just pressed send. Thank you. Oh, you just, okay, great. I forgot to press send. Thank you. And I, I'll read it aloud again if that's okay, Mr. Yes, Scott? please, because I, okay. I don't think we I moved to, well, I moved to have Mr. Duke and his team recognize Diwali, Lunar New Year, and Eid al Fitr as professional development days for the 2021, or the 2022 to 2023 school year, and on those holidays that fall on weekends to consider recognizing the uh, Monday after the holiday of the weekend, or the Friday before the weekend as professional development days. 
And I want to make sure it was seconded by who? Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey. Okay. So, Mr. Yeah, I was just going to repeat it so that it's official. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Thomas moved to recognize um, Diwali Monday, October 24th. That's the email that you just sent. Um, and um, Monday, I think this email looks different than what you it just said. It does look different than what I just said. I realized that as I was typing it. Um, let me update the email. My apologies. Sent to Ms. Scott. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Thomas moved to recognize Diwali Lunar New Year Eid al Fatur as PD days for the 2022 through 2023 year. And for those holidays that are on weekends, to recognize the prior Friday or after Monday for the PD day. And it was seconded by Ms. Causey. And PD, you mean professional development. Yes. I'm make sure that was clear. Okay. And I see there are a couple of questions. Um, Ms. Hen and then Ms. Matt, um, excuse me, uh, Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I move to amend Mr. Thomas's motion um, to add and to ask Mr. Duke to bring two revised calendars reflecting these changes, one pre and one post Labor Day start to the board for consideration. Second, Causey. Okay, so Ms. Hinn has moved to, um, could you send that to me so that I could properly state that as well? And it was moved by Ms. Hen and seconded by Ms. Causey. Thank you. Okay, so Ms. Hen moved to amend the motion to add and to ask Mr. Dukes to bring two revised calendars reflecting these changes, one pre and one post Labor Day start to the board for consideration. That was seconded by Ms. Causey. Okay, so are there any um, questions or, or changes or anything to the amendment, not the original motion? I want to make sure I get, I believe it was Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Causey. So um, I would like under the amendment for Mr. Duke when he considers the post Labor Day calendar to actually take a look at the calendar sent to the board by Mr. Friedman because that calendar specifically has only 188 teacher days, which might allow for some of these holidays. Um, so if the post Labor Day calendar that the amendment asks for would be taken into consideration, not just the post Labor Day calendar, the calendar committee created, but also take a look at the one that Mr. Friedman created, which starts after Labor Day, but also the last day of school is June, um, June 12th or June uh, 16th if we have makeup days. Um, I think that that calendar could meet the needs of a lot of different people because, as Ms. Pasteur said, there are a lot of families in agricultural fields, different um, fisheries and whatnot. Children work during the summer. And that is also part of the reason why we have children who don't enroll till October because they're still working. So. Starting earlier in the year leads to absentee rate. No matter when we start or finish, it's going to impact somebody. 
but I think that not sliding into full year school is a good thing. Thank you. Next is Ms. Causey. Thank you. I just wanted to ask Mr. Duke, um, because we've heard that there's a number of things that are still not available because of the ransomware attack. Um, is the work of the policy review committee in the year 2015 um, under the leadership of Romaine Williams still available where she did um, a great deal of uh, research and community input around um, equitable religious holiday observance? I can't answer that question. I'm not aware of whether it's available or not. I know there was a report that was produced. Um, I have a copy of that report, but as far as the raw data, I have no idea if it's still uh, existent. Okay, I would. I would think it would be very helpful for the board to. Sorry, speak. excuse me. Point of order, Ms. Causey. We're discussing the amendment, the amendment, not the main motion. And the amendment is to ask Mr. Dukes to bring two revised calendars reflecting the changes. <sighs> one pre and one post Labor Day to the board for consideration. That's what, what we're discussing, the amendment. Do you okay. have any questions about the amendment? Um, no, I'd like to make a motion after this vote is over, though. Okay, but we're okay? on the amendment. Yeah, I understand. Okay, so then. I so an, I any questions on the amendment? No, okay, thank you. Was there anyone else that had any questions in regards to the amendment? Yes, Mr. Thomas. I move to amend Ms. Hen's amendment to, for, to ask Mr. Duke for the post Labor Day calendar to recognize Juneteenth as the federal holiday Juneteenth as a school closure. And I can send that to you and to um, Ms. Tracy. I was gonna ask if you could send that to me and is there a second? Because I don't know that everyone- Second row. Was seconded by Ms. Rell, okay? Because I want to properly state that because I don't, I, oh yes, Dr. Hager. Um, I just had a question because I, I was gonna make an, I know we can only make two amendments on a motion and I was going to make a similar. Uh, no, no, you can um, amend the main motion several times. It's only you can make, um, uh, you can only amend it, the amendment twice. So we don't amend, amend, amend. Okay. Mr. Mercedes, would you like to weigh in on that please? Oh, he, Ms. Hen first, Ms. then Mr. Thomas, okay. Yeah. No, just in, insure, ensuring that we also recognize Eid al-Adha, which is at the end of June, and could, if we add all these professional development days with a post-Labor Day start, I'm just concerned that we're getting closer to that holiday as well, just mm -hmm. um, trying to be inclusive of all the the holidays that we're, we're discussing. So I don't know how to add that now. <laughs> so I just wanted to say. Yeah, we've already made the two amendments. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Uh, I wish to withdraw my uh, motion and have uh, uh, my, amendment. my amendment and have Miss have Dr. Hager read her amendment. Thank you. Thank you, for that. Mr. Mercedes. Is that appropriate? I missed that part. He wishes to withdraw his amendment. And maybe the best thing to do would be to process uh, Ms. Hen's amendment, and then we can uh, have a second amendment. Have a second amendment. Okay. We can do that then, because it's starting to um, get a little disjoint. All right, so we can process Ms. Hen's amendment, which um, I will read again. Ms. Hen's amendment is to the main motion, and um, the main motion by Mr. Thomas was to move to recognize Diwali Lunar New Year Eid al Fitr as professional development days for the 2022 2023 year and for these holidays that are on weekends to recognize the prior Friday on or after Monday for the professional development day. Ms. Hen made an amendment to that main motion to add and to ask Mr. Dukes to bring two revised calendars reflecting these changes. One, prepare, one pre and one post Labor Day start to the board for consideration. So what we're doing now is processing Ms. Hen's amendment. Any questions? Now, okay, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote please on Ms. Hen's amendment. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? 
Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the amendment passes. So now the motion would re reads, I move uh, to recognize Diwali, Lunar New Year, Eid al Fitur as PD days for the 2022-2023 year and for those holidays that are on weekends to recognize the prior Friday or after Monday for the PD day and to ask Mr. Dukes to bring two revised calendars reflecting these changes, one pre and one post Labor Day start to the board for consideration as was just amended. And you had a... So my, I, I move to amend the motion to add two additional holidays, which would be Juneteenth and Eid al-Adha, mm -hmm. which occur in June and could be impacted with the given with the additional PD days or the post Labor Day start, but the the actual motion is just adding those two holidays to the middle of your existing motion. Second, Ms. Causey. Okay, that's what I was going to ask if there was a second. Um, and I was just looking. Um, what you just said is that what you emailed to me? Yes, but really, it would the the change is just adding those two in the middle. That's the amendment to the. I don't have Mr. Mr. Thomas's existing motion, but them in there but that would be okay so you want to add this this language into the motion to so, ollie lunar new year yeah yeah I'm, I'm looking at what you what you send over the bold the bold part is what would be added to the sender Mr. Mercedes, can I get a um, legal opinion just to confirm? Would it need to be a new motion as opposed to an amendment? It's amending this. That's okay. So it's an amendment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a new motion to the amended motion. Okay. All right, um, and it was seconded by Ms. Causey, and it's to add um, Juneteenth and Eid al Atar. Um, questions? Yes, Mr. Thomas, and then Ms. Causey. Thank you. Uh, I know that, Dr. Hager, you don't have my original motion present, but that would designate Juneteenth as a professional development day um, for the school year. So <laughs> if you could denote whether or not they would be professional development days or closures for Juneteenth. Uh, I would appreciate. Yeah, it's been moved and seconded. Um, so your question, Mr. Thomas, is is if she can add a date to Juneteenth? No. Uh, my original motion would read uh, with the amendment. I move to recognize Diwali, Lunar New Year, Eid al Fitar, Eid al uh, Altar, and. Mm -hmm. um, Juneteenth as PD days, uh, but I'm not sure if Miss Dr. Hager's intent was to recognize Juneteenth as a closure or professional development day. So I was just asking for clarification. And if, and it, because it wasn't designated, then maybe we should consider making that designation. It would be a PD day, based on how my original motion is written. So it would be, a, based on the original motion, it would be a PD day, and that was not your intention, it was for it to be a, it was for it to be a closure? Okay. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Can we agree on consensus that it is supposed, that it would be a closure? I think we'd have to take a, um, have a motion and, and take a vote on that. Um, yeah, this is... What if we just like, right so basically yeah, what Wanda, restate her motion? Miss Dr. Hager, restate your motion. Oh, excuse me, Dr. Hager. Yeah. Just restate it. Restate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um to amend the motion to add Juneteenth as a closure day. Can I do that? Can I change it at this point? No, you have to state so the exactly. original motion. Yeah, so I said it was uh, to add Juneteenth and Eid al Adha to the list that was already stated. Okay. So, um, in order to change that, then, Mr. Mercedes, would she have to um, withdraw her amendment? I think what her intent was to add Eid al Adha 
Michelle Lada as a professional development day and Juneteenth as a closure day. Then it was yours? Okay, I thought you wanted them both as closure. Okay. Okay, so then um, Mr. Thomas had asked if we could agree to that by consensus. Okay. Well, so, well she was clarifying her, her, intent. her, her intent, so it wouldn't be even be consensus. It would, that was just how the, her amendment would be. Okay, can you email that over to me, please? Because I want to make sure it's very clear. Okay, was there any any questions? Sorry. Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to reiterate um, my suggestion. It would be helpful for the board to receive the report from uh, board member Romaine Williams, uh, who was the chair of the policy review committee in 2015. If the school system does not have that report, I probably do. So um, I think it would be uh, important to include that. There was a lot of great work done. Dr. Farone can speak to that, and I. Thank you. Were there any other questions? Um, uh, oh, thank you, Dr. Hager. So I will um, read Dr. Hager's amendment. Um, uh, Dr. Hager moved to amend the motion to add Juneteenth, Monday, June 19th, 2023, as a school closure day and Eid El Adha. Thursday, June 29th, 2023, as a professional development day. And it was seconded by, was that Ms. Rowe or Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey, okay, thank you. Were there any questions on, um, additional questions or comments on that motion? On that amendment? Okay, all right, um, Ms. Gover, we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Yes, so that passes. Thank you. And now we, yes, Ms. Causey. Um, I wanted to um, make a motion. I move BCPS staff will conduct a survey of all employees to receive input on preference for pre or post Labor Day start to school. Data would be disaggregated by employee bargaining units, include a comment opportunity and or selection from reasons why. Results of survey would be provided to the board prior to the next board meeting. BCS BCPS staff will provide data to the board on other Maryland school districts that have made decisions for the 2022-2023 school year prior to the next board meeting. And BCPS staff will provide minutes or notes of discussions of the calendar committee to the board prior to the next board meeting. Second row. Yes, Mr. Brasides. Well, Ms. Scott, uh, this is not uh, the appropriate time for that particular motion. We, the uh, main motion, which Again, with Mr. Thomas, and Ms. Rowe, uh, we've worked through the Penn Amendment and the Hager Amendment. So now the, the whole ball of wax, the main motion needs to be addressed first, and then Ms. Causey can make her motion. Yes, so that motion is out of order. I thought we voted for the whole thing. No, it, we voted for the two amendments, and now we have to vote on the main motion. Thank you. Okay, so now the main motion. And um, sorry, I'm getting this in here. The main motion, as I recall, I want to make sure I have it right, was made by Mr. Thomas, correct? And it was to move to recognize Diwali Lunar New Year Eid al Fitr as PD days for the 2022-2023 year, and for those holidays that are on weekends to recognize the prior the prior Friday or after Monday for the PD days. That was the main motion. It was seconded by, I believe it was Ms. Causey. Yes, that was the main motion. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that was the main motion. And then now it's gone through two rounds of amendments. Yes, so now we vote on the main motion. Did you want to speak to it or? Yes. Madam Chair. 
Are we voting on the main motion as amended? We're voting on the main motion as amended. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Yes, I just yeah. wanted to state that um, as Michelle Wong said earlier uh, in her article in the Delaney Griffin, uh, this is all these holidays were recognized. Uh, I think excluding Juneteenth and uh, Eid Al Adha were all recognized in the Howard County County starting uh, Howard County calendar starting in 2016. Um, and I think that these PD days also serve as an opportunity for our teachers to have uh, opportunities for training throughout the year since there are uh, only a few PD days at the beginning of the school year. And it also serves as a break that's needed throughout the uh, school year for individuals that aren't celebrating the holidays. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll just, it, it is quite long, so I, I will read that just so that we're clear. The, the main motion, and I apologize, but I'll read it again, is uh, to recognize Diwali Lunar New Year Eid al Futuras PD Days for the 2022-2023 year and for those holidays that are on weekends to recognize the prior Friday or after Monday for the PD Days. It was amended and, and to ask... Mr. Du to add to ask Mr. Dukes to bring two revised calendars reflecting these changes, one pre one post Labor Day start to the board for consideration, and it was amended again to add Juneteenth, um, Monday June 19, 2023, as a school closure day and Eid Al Adha, Thursday June 29, 2023, as a professional development day. So is everyone clear? That's the motion, the main motion we're voting on. Okay. Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we've processed the main motion and both amendments. Okay. Now, Ms. Causey, you had a, um, a statement? Thank you. I move BCPS staff will conduct a survey of all employees to receive input on preference for pre or post Labor Day start to school. Data would be disaggregated by employee bargaining units, include a comment opportunity and or selection from reasons why. Results of survey would be provided to the board prior to the next board meeting. BCPS staff will provide data to the board on other Maryland school districts that have made decisions for the 2022-2023 school year prior to the next board meeting and BCPS staff will provide minutes or notes of discussions of the calendar committee to the board prior to the next board meeting. Second row. So it's moved by Ms. Causey that BCPS staff will conduct a survey of all employees to receive input on preference for pre or post Labor Day start to school. Data will be disaggregated by employee bargaining units. Conclude a comment opportunity and or selection from reasons why results of survey would be provided to the board prior to the next board meeting. BCPS staff will provide data to the board on other Maryland school districts that have made decisions for the 2022-23 school year. Prior to the next board meeting, BCPS staff will provide minutes or notes of discussion of calendar committee to the board prior to the next board meeting and it was seconded by Ms. Rell. Yes, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Can I, can I speak to the second? Well, we were going around, so, I mean, if you don't mind, you could speak after Mr. Kuhn. Is that okay? Sure, that's fine. Thank you. Ms. Scott, I did speak to my motion. Sorry, I didn't. I right, so I have a question about this because it looks like we're asking for data so we can make a better informed decision about what our employees, everyone else wants. Um, and I don't disagree with that in principle, but part of my concern is we're asking Mr. Dukes to go and provide us with new calendars and we're not going to see those calendars and they're not going to be made public until the next meeting. And if we're, we're in a process of trying to collect data and the teachers and everyone can't actually see what those options are going to be, I believe we're kind of putting the cart before the horse. Um, and people may not even, you know, know which direction they want to go. I understand pre and post Labor Day, that's pretty clear. But with the addition of everything that we've talked about here tonight, I don't quite know if we're going to get what we're looking for. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? So I, I agree with what Mr. Kuhn is saying, is that this entire process is 
a little bit cart before the horse in many ways because in one sense, the school system has asked this board to make a decision for all subsequent years into an infinite amount of years moving forward, but no survey of the public or employees has been done to provide this board with any idea about what any of our constituents that we represent want. And I have a hard time thinking that I'm qualified to sit here and make a decision beyond just this next year without asking our community what they want moving forward. So I think the reason that I seconded asking for all of this data is not just about this next year moving forward, but because we're also being asked to make a decision about all subsequent years, whether they will be pre or post Labor Day. And I think that while it would have been nice to have that data three or four months ago, um, having an open-ended comment section on the request for data allow people to expand on their reasonings of, well, I want, I want post Labor Day unless it means we have no spring break and then I want pre, right? So I think we can get some level of data to get a sense of what people want, but sure, it would have been better to do it months ago. Ms. Causey. Thank you. And speaking to my motion, um, and Dr. Williams said this earlier today, um, that the teachers and our educators and staff are more effective in providing instruction and supporting our teachers when they themselves are at their greatest well-being. And if we are told by an objective outside party that teacher morale is not good with 6,000 comments, I feel it's important to really understand what will improve morale, what is their viewpoint. I think that there's been work sufficient in the current calendars to show um, employees and teachers and parents and staff, and that's a good point as well, um, what the difference would be and understanding that the board is considering changing to um, in, be more inclusive um, to, to get that understanding. But I think it's important to have the data and um, I think your point is well taken about future years uh, I think it's somewhat um, premature coming out of the pandemic to think that today we can decide what's going to happen more than a year in advance at this point. So um, I think what's really important is for us as we're still recovering, because we've, we're hearing from our students, Dr. Williams, we're not recovered. So let's make the best decision we can this year with the most input we can have, but especially because we want instruction to be at its best, we want student support to be at its best, to get the input from those frontline uh, workers, th those professionals that support our students. Thank you. Ms. Jose? Thank you, uh, Ms. Scott. Mr. Duke, with this, um, it, it's a lot of work what this board is asking you to do in two weeks. And I, I don't think, just like Mr. Kuhn said, um, the amount of work that's needed. I also want to hear from Dr. Williams uh, about how this is going to impact uh, doing this survey because I believe, I don't know the time, how much time would it take to do this survey? Would you have that back in two weeks? Is it even possible? From my perspective, I'm concerned about the survey and asking for that kind of data. Um, I don't know what implications that all has. Uh, it's out of, out of the scope of my office. Uh, I only have a two-person office. Um, so I would have to rely on DRAW to potentially uh, put together a survey and then disseminating the survey with instructions and then collecting the data and the feedback and then uh, analyzing that feedback and putting it in, into a reportable form back to you all. Um, so I, I think two that weeks. it's a little bit um, ambitious. You, you can do it under two weeks. I, I just think I'll it's preposterous it <laughs> to, even to, to ask this of you with two people in your office. Um, Dr. Williams. So, thank you, Ms. Joe, since you raised the question to me as well. The staff can produce a survey. It is the analysis of it, and then when you add an open-ended component and you're asking this for two weeks um, in the midst of all that we're doing that's an additional 
work. So it's not that staff can't do it. The staff can do, and they have done wonderful things. It's just what you're asking for at this time to bring back in two weeks. And then for staff, and I'm looking at Ms. Sexton and other union leaders about that's one more thing you're asking folks to do and within a shortened window. So that's just, that's just the reality. Ms. Pastor. Okay, actually, it, the, the motion said some of the information needed to be less than two weeks. And to make this equitable, all people who have to come back need to be surveyed, not just teachers. That would be paras and, and cafeteria folks and custodians and everyone. That's a lot of work from a lot of different corners, and we want to move forward. And I agree with Mr. Kuhn that they would only be doing it in a vacuum because they won't know what it looks like because we just ask you tonight to reshape it. Um, so as Ms. Rose said, if this had been given to us months ago and we could have one with fidelity, I could agree with it. But no, all we would get is cut and paste in less than two weeks. And if we want to really know what all of the areas, all of the bargaining units are saying, we need to give the time and the integrity to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, and I agree with Ms. Festor. I think that maybe this is something that we do for next school year's calendar. Maybe we start the school the calendar process a little earlier. We can produce a survey maybe in the springtime of this year of this upcoming school this school year. So in 2022, this spring 2022, so that we can have that data for next year. But I, I don't think that is necessarily um, the best thing for this year in, in the short period of time that we have. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, I concur as well, and I would add parents and students to the list of people who also need to be surveyed if we're, if we're thinking about doing this, and, and I don't see how it would be feasible to do in two weeks at all. And just to follow up on something that was asked earlier, do we, I know the sooner the better is the, is the answer that we're looking for with the calendar, but is there an actual date where we're required to have a calendar that is approved? No, ma'am. Okay. I mean, again, I, mean, I agree that sooner the better. Uh, well, let me retract that statement. Uh, according to the policy and, and superintendent's rule, um, we're supposed to have a calendar approved by um, the first uh, business meeting of the board in November. So we would um, be in violation of, of the superintendent's rule and policy. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? So I'd like to amend this motion to change the deadline for the survey and the research to the first meeting in March and you email that I, I will to change the deadline to the first meeting in March and to understand that this board will not be making a decision on subsequent years Labor Day pre or post without the survey research of all constituents. Is there a second? Okay. Um, and you, if you could email that to me, um, because in the amendment, are you adding language um, or taking I'm away? I'm not, or striking? Kind of both. Um, okay, let's. Let me, let me just send this If to everyone you. could be very specific when you're making motions and amendments, if you're adding language, please say so. If you're striking language, please say so. And please email it over so that I can properly state it so that we can at least have some idea of what you're saying. Okay. Oh, Janet, we, there were some questions. You, um, it was Ms. Rowe, did you, ha I mean, excuse me, Ms. Rowe made the motion, it was seconded by Ms. Mack. Okay, but I saw, I thought I saw some hands. I was just trying to make sure it was um, to the motion. Um, Ms. Causey and, or, and Ms. Mack. I had a comment, but Ms. Rowe's motion yeah, I'm waiting for that. Comment. I'm just trying to make sure I have. Um... Oh, 
Okay, it's coming over. Makita, you should have it now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Ms. Rowe um, amended, moves to amend the motion to strike the deadline and add a deadline of the first meeting in March for survey information of all constituents holding a decision on subsequent years calendars until survey data is processed and it was seconded by Ms. Mack. Yes, yeah, so it looks like there's some questions. Um, I want to make sure I get everybody in, in order here. I think I saw Ms. Causey first, Ms. Mack, Ms. Hen, and then Ms. Pastor. Oh, Ms. Pastor was first? Before Ms. Hen. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Causey. Um, actually, I'll ask my question if Ms. Rowe needs to speak to her motion. Well, I... I think there, um, what I heard in the comments is that there's some consensus on the board to get this data and to make the decision about subsequent year's calendars based on actual feedback from all of our constituents and stakeholders about whether they prefer pre or post Labor Day. And that in order to make decisions about subsequent years, we need that data. Excuse me, um, Ms. Rowe, uh, I have a point of inquiry for your um, amendment, you said to strike the deadline. The word deadline is not in the original oh, motion. To strike, to strike the original, Ms. Causey's original motion had uh, deadlines of the, to have this survey data by the next meeting. So what I'm saying is strike the language that says we have to have it by the next meeting. Then you would have had to said that in the amendment to strike that language. I don't have the language for her amendment to amend it by wording like that. So... So you I made an amendment to something you didn't have the language to amend? Well, it's not like it's Madam sitting in Chair, front of me. So I did email it to all board members. They can just Hang edit. on. I don't see this. My intention was to not have it due by the next meeting, but have it due by the first meeting in March. Okay, so then... <sighs> um. Yes, but I, I want to, um, for clarification, because if we're striking language, we need to state the language that's being struck. It looks like Ms. Causey sent that out to everyone. Um, Mr. Bersades, can she, the best way to get out of this, because she's saying strike the deadline, but that language is not in the motion. So would she... Mm -hmm. So um, if we have an idea and we understand what she's coming from, can we continue or do we have, yeah, we, can continue. we can continue. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Okay, so I was going around. Ms. Clausey when um, Ms. Mack, did, oh, did you go Ms. Clausey? I can't tell if your thing is up or, okay. Ms. Mack? I just wanted to make the point that as the original motion said within two by the next board meeting, I, I didn't think it would be a valid survey. So I support the motion that Ms. Um, Rowe just made because I think it will provide very important information for board members to make decisions on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Ms. Hen? <coughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. Ms. Pastor. I apologize, Ms. Pastor. I was going to ask if we could strike, and this may be a second amendment to Ms. Causey's motion, um, move to strike the second um, paragraph, which you don't all have, but the second part of Ms. Causey's motion says BCPS staff will provide data to the board on other Maryland school districts that have made decisions for the 2022 to 2023 school year prior to the next board meeting. BCPS staff will provide minutes or notes of discussions of calendar committee to the board prior to the next board meeting. Um, I move to strike that. I believe the, that can be a request of Dr. Williams if that information is um, needed that could be provided in a weekly update that is not germane to this motion on the floor. If, if 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Hen. I did, Is there a second? I did second, ask Thomas. for that before and didn't receive it. So. Okay, thank you. So the motion is um, by Ms. Hen, uh, a second amendment. Um, she made the amendment to strike. BCPS staff will provide data to the board on other Maryland school districts that have made decisions for the 2022-2023 school year. Prior to the next board meeting, BCPS staff will provide minutes or notes of discussion of calendar committee to the board prior to the next meeting. And that was seconded by Mr. Thomas. Would you like to speak to your motion? I'm sorry, do we have to process the First Amendment first? We have processed this amendment and then the second amendment and then the main motion. Sure. May I speak to my motion? Yes. Thank you. I, I just think there's a lot to the original motion and I'm making this to um, streamline and, and keep it clean. And I think we can um, handle this as an information request amongst the, the leadership team. And given Ms. Rowe's motion um, and the timing, I believe this is no longer... Um, germane to the motion as amended by Ms. Rowe. And thank you, Mr. Thomas, for your second. Thank you. Are there any other questions in regards to Ms. Hen's amendment? Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, thank you, Ms. Hen, for your comments. Um, I would say that I would like those left in there um, because, number one, I did make a request for that information and it was not in the weekly update and it was not provided today. Um, we also had our Area Education Advisory Council coordinator email the board with concerns that we did not understand the full com comments that took place in the calendar committee and that could help provide information to us. Um, and the other issue is I'm hoping that board members reject Ms. Rowe's, um, reject your amendment, reject Ms. Rowe's amendment. Um, and I wanted to clarify and supports my amendment. Our teacher morale and our employee morale is low now. And I think getting their input, understanding what they think is gonna be most effective is going to be helpful as soon as we can make a decision based on that input. If the survey needs to be done later, I mean, uh, Mr. Duke, I would like also someone to read the policy because I don't believe we're in violation of not approving it. It just needs to be presented at, this, at, at the meeting um, for approval. It doesn't state that it needs to be approved. Um, but, but Mr. Brusades or someone could look that up. Um, the other thing is the survey says to, excuse me, my motion says, and I emailed it to the full board, include a common opportunity and or selection from reasons why. So I'm leaving that up to draw on Mr. Duke to decide what would be most effective. Ms. Cousy, we're only discussing the amendment. The questions are about the amendment to the second paragraph. That's it. I understand that, Ms. Scott, Point of and order. what I yes. am doing is trying to clarify for the board members why I think her yes, but it's it's, con it's confused. What we're we're processing the second amendment, and that is what we need to process and what we need to move forward and vote on. And that is what I'm commenting so, on. All okay. of the information I believe board members need to reject Miss Hen's motion. All right. So um, I haven't really spoken other than going around. Um, I would just like to say that. I feel that um, this motion is an example of what came out of the efficiency review. Um, uh, 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 micromanagement and going into operations. I feel that this is an example of that and that um, this is what is hindering the process. This is what's contributing to low morale. And this is what is, con is causing this board to not really move forward and, and, and process things. This is an example of micromanagement and going into operations and making motions and things that, uh, that, that go into operations. So we just heard about this. We just had an efficiency review on this. These are some of the things that we're supposed to be working on yet and still we're still, um, still doing it. So yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I believe if we accept Ms. Hen's motion and Ms. Rowe's motion to have a survey uh, by the first March, first meeting of March, that that would be something that the board should adopt. And I don't think that's necessarily micromanagement because that would provide board members the insight as to what the uh, staff members and students in BCPS would like to see in parents and our, all of our community members. I think that survey would be very productive and it would allow for a kind of better understanding of what the system as a whole wants and not necessarily um, 
I don't, I don't, I don't believe we go into operations, but that's just my opinion. Uh, so I wanted to share that and say that I am in supportiveness. Uh, Hen's motion, and Ms. Roy's motion, to ultimately approve Ms. Causey's motion amended twice. Thank you. Are we ready for the vote? Ms. Hen. Thank you. Quick point of inquiry um, for Ms. Rowe, if I may. Um, Ms. Rowe, does your motion expand the survey audience to include um, all stakeholders? All, yes, all constituents all and stakeholders. All stakeholders, as Dr. Hager suggested. Thank you. Any more questions or discussions? No? Okay. Ms. Gover, if we could have a roll call vote on Ms. Hen's secondary amendment, and I will read it again. <coughs> it is to strike the second paragraph of Ms. Causey's motion, and I will um, read the second paragraph again. BCPS staff will provide data to the board and other Maryland school, on other, excuse me, Maryland school districts that have made decisions for the 2022-2023 school year prior to the next board meeting. BCPS staff will provide minutes or notes of discussions of calendar committee to the board prior to the next board meeting. And it was seconded by Mr. Thomas. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Passes. Favor is seven. Okay, so that passes. So now the next thing is to process Ms. Rowe's amendment. And Ms. Rowe's amendment was to, um, yes, I'll, I'll read it again so that everybody <laughs> has it, is to amend the motion to strike the deadline. Um, which um, to strike the deadline and add a deadline of the first meeting in March for survey information of all constituents holding a decision on subsequent years calendars until survey data is processed. Mr. Thomas and then Ms. Causey. I move to the previous question. Okay, so the question has been moved. And we'll vote on the moving of the question. And what that is is that ends debate. And then we would vote on the amendment. Ms. Gover, could we have a roll call on um, the question, on moving the question? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. <laughs> Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Okay. Favor is eight. Okay, so the question has been moved. So now we will vote on the amendment. And the, again, the amendment is to strike the deadline and add a deadline of the first meeting in March for survey information of all constituents holding a decision on subsequent year's calendars until survey data is processed. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Excuse me, the, um, there was a question. I didn't no, see. No, we, uh, we, there's no question. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's right, we, the question. I'm sorry. Thank you, Ms. Matt. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so now we're voting on the main motion, and it's I move BCPS staff will conduct a survey of all employees to receive input on preference for pre- or post-Labor Day start to school. Data will be disaggregated by employee bargaining units, include a common opportunity and or selection from reasons why. Results of survey would be provided 
to the board, and it was um, Ms. Rowe moved to strike an ad by the first meeting in March, and the second paragraph was struck altogether. Yes. Ms. Excuse me, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I, so I am going to vote yes to this because uh, there's consensus on the board that we want this information for the future. Um, but I am, and I also support including all stakeholders. Um, but I also believe that there should be some survey uh, to get input from um, our teachers and, and employees uh, because it's, it's in, important to let them know they're valued and they're on the front lines and to give us that, that input. But I will vote to support this because there's consensus on the board and it's certainly better to have information than not have it, but I think the timing should be sooner. <coughs> Any discussion? Are we ready for the vote? Okay. Ms. Gover? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Abstain. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. It doesn't pass. Does it? Favor is eight. Thank you. Passes, okay. All right, I think we're done, Mr. Dukes. <laughs> I had to double check there. Thank you. That was your thought. All right, and the next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policy, policies. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend board policy 8210, internal board policies, duties, and responsibilities, board officers' elections, and terms of office. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit M. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So moved, Roe. Second, Hen. Thank you. No second is needed, though, since it comes from the committee, but thank you. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Off um, Pasture? Staying. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Favor is seven. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the next item on the agenda is the update on the operational review for the Board of Education. And I don't know if it's already on the screen or already queued to come up. To come up. This was prepared. There it is. This was prepared by um, myself and Miss Julie Hen. And so it's the efficiency review update um, with uh, items that the board is working on to improve our functioning and our, um, our role. So we are going to um, both do the um, presentation. All right, so it starts with me. So basically, um, the one of the f um, recommendations was that uh, the board should enlist MABE to conduct work sessions on board governance with the goal of minimizing or eliminating micromanagement of staff and to establish a topical yearly work sessions calendar. Um, 
and it said that um, BCPS and legal BCPS legal counsel and the superintendent should create pre-candidate board materials and training sessions, update, improve the board orientation training, strongly encourage board members to take MABE and NSBA training plan retreats tailored to the board's needs and ensure board training funds are not transferred for other expenses. And um, so that's the um, what was from um, Public Works. And so what's in red is, is what the board is doing. Board members researched uh, potential opportunities for professional development at the 2022 NSBA annual conference and pre-conference. The board is working to identify and offer training opportunities for board members to enrich their knowledge. The Maryland Association of Educators, MABE, offers um, many upcoming trainings that board members will participate in. On Friday, I believe it's about eight of us, um, November 12th, May will be offering uh, training on what the blueprint means for collective bargaining. And um, Mrs. Pastor is, um, uh, uh, May selected her to be on, on uh, a part of that organization, of that committee. But it's available to all board members. And like I said, we've had eight of us sign up. Additionally, May will have new board membership training coming up for board members if you'd like to reorient yourself in the role of a board member. And several board members, as I mentioned, were selected by May to serve on several state committees and an ad hoc committee in order to keep other board ourselves along with other board members informed and active on statewide issues. Um, information was requested about the May Master's Board um, May Master Board Program, and the criteria is as follows. It, it requires uh, full participation by the board. The board has to come to a consensus, and um, several uh, trainings would be held with MABE, and it's it's a costly program. It's a minimum of 2000 to 3000 for board training, and these are there are several trainings that the board members can take, which would increase their knowledge base and help us to become an overall well-trained board. So that's the first one. And Ms. Hen will do the next one. Thank you. So another recommendation by Public Works is that the board should update our self-assessment instrument. So each year annually, we complete a self-assessment. The board has um, recently reviewed the instrument that we use for that assessment. However, it does not include metrics, which was a recommendation by Public Works. So board leadership will be reviewing our current self-evaluation instrument, and we're considering appointing an ad hoc committee to draft metrics for consideration. Another improvement that we are um, making is to increase participation in the self-assessment process itself. We want to see 100% participation of all board members. Um, Public Works also recommends that the results be compiled by our board attorney, who would then lead a board work session to review the results and create a plan of action to address deficiencies. So again, this is a process for professional development in which we hope to seek resources such as those provided by MABE to help us through. Thank you. And we can go to the next one. Uh, another uh, recommendation is BCPS should revise the board agenda preparation delivery board members and board approval process to eliminate unnecessary late entries, minimize board approval time, and expedite meetings. The board changed the agenda process to include going around at the end of the meeting to get agenda items from board members, and the board is working in PRC to revise the agenda approval process. Board policy 8314 meetings agenda has been on the policy review committee's agenda five times since September of 2020. The policy for review by the committee at its October, I'm sorry, the policy was for review by the committee at its October 18th, 2021 meeting and was approved to go forward to the full board for first reader. Public Works also recommended that the board create a detailed user-friendly subject index for our policy manu manual with word search capability um, for both policies and superintendent's rules. Um, Can you advance the slide? Can you advance the slide? Thank you. Sorry. Staff for the Policy Review Committee are currently reviewing options available through board docs and will report to the PRC next month. Currently, there is a search feature available through board docs, which works on policies as well as superintendent's rules. 
and board leadership will be um, working to develop a user-friendly how-to guide um, for the public on how to search policies and rules so that the public can take advantage of the um, functionality in board docs that already exists. Thank you. And then the next one is the board should develop, adopt, and implement a five-year systemic review schedule for all policies and continue general counsel's annual review of specific policies as required by Maryland law. Uh, in June of 2019, the Peers Policy Review Committee reviewed policy 83-8130 and recommended that the policy be changed from a five-year review to a seven-year review process. The board adopted this change at its meeting on on August 6, 2019, uh, there is no requirement in Maryland law or regulation that governs how often all local board policies are to be reviewed. So while the recommendation is that all policies be reviewed every five years, um, we have been increasing the number of policies that are reviewed on a yearly basis, as this chart indicates, um, with 47 policies reviewed by the PRC last year. Um, 39 of those moved forward to the board, again, um, increasing year over year for the last three years. 26 were approved by the board. Um, 13 were returned to the PRC for additional changes, showing, again, a commitment to continuous improvement of our policies, which we believe is the intent of the recommendation to review all policies on a five-year basis. BCPS should create a policy provision containing a list of existing procedural manuals, handbooks, and planning documents, and on the website, create a series of hot links from the manual to the cited documents or procedures. Um, and so now with this one, it, um, we learned that staff does not believe a policy provision is necessary. However, um, staff will research how to make other resources more accessible. The current standard language in all board policies is the superintendent will implement this policy. So Public Works also recommended that the board refine the superintendent's evaluation in instrument to include some key metrics, require the board legal counsel to compile the results, and implement quarterly board updates on progress. We're not sure what documents were provided to Public Works in this process because our current evaluation instrument does include key metrics, um, and the, the board's ad hoc committee did develop um, that instrument with key metrics. And as a confidential personnel item, those updates on progress are shared internally with the board. Um, board policy 8501 discusses the superintendent's evaluation, and that is scheduled for review this school year. Thank you. So we left that open at the end for next steps because I wanted to hear from board members some input on what board members are doing um, or taking part in to help the board help themselves to grow in our position so that we can be a better, um, more functioning um, board. So, um, yes, Ms. Rowe. So um, I have two things. So to answer that question, there is a book um, the, that is about board governance that I believe almost all the board members have. It was given to me when I first came on the board um, by Ms. Causey. And I think that continuing to read and examine that book is a, is a very good thing. But the question I had is, there seems to be some confusion in the efficiency review about the Office of Internal Audit. And as the Office of Internal Audit is directly reporting to the board, I don't know that the Audit Committee has been given any guidance from the full board as to what we should do about any of those recommendations and we're going to be hearing from the office of internal audit their response to the recommendations and i just wondered it, why that wasn't included in this update today this update today was about the board itself and the things that we as a board need to work on and improve upon and so this was what this update was about this is not the only update though okay. we gave an update um at the um not the last board meeting but the one before we'll give an update at this one and then we'll we'll give another update so um we can't give an update on everything at the same time so that's further down the line 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. Were there any other questions or statements? Yes, Ms. Jose. Ms. Scott, one of the, the findings was that we do more training. It, has there been a fiscal impact of that increased training? And also, do we have, if at the next um, report, if you could give a analysis of how many board members attend these trainings, and they're not mandatory, um, you know, how could we encourage more people to attend conferences? Mm -hmm. And because those are learning opportunities, and you know, maybe update policy, so come up with recommendations so we can get more people to be engaged and continue. We, we ask that of our teachers, so we should also continue learning and educate ourselves and the, the next board or you know, the future boards as well. So if that could be. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, our meetings have been more efficient in the past year. We've almost cut our um, time from midnight to 9, 10. So if we could get a breakdown of that as well, what kind of fiscal impact that has in, in more efficient and effective meetings time-wise, fiscally. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Were there any other questions or suggestions? Yes, Mr. Kuhn. Well, thank you for pulling all of that together. I appreciate it. One of the things that I think um, as a board we should do is really publicize and make available materials for people that are interested in becoming board members because there's a lot to understand here and it takes a significant amount of time and people need to understand that if they're going to get involved and I hope that they do. Um, and it needs to be laid out in ways that they can they can manage it and understand it, uh, so that they you know are prepared for what they're walking into potentially, um, and and then they can perform. So I would just suggest as you know we're, we're talking about ourselves, but we have limited time left. We have we have just over a year left out of four years, um, and I know that. You know, people have to be thinking now if they're interested going forward. So just helping to educate the public on how to be, you know, you know what it takes, what they need to understand, how things work, is I, I think something that, that we should do um, as part of all this activity. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, building off of what Mr. Kuhn said, I think that should apply to the student member of the board too. I think we could get a lot more engagement in students that know about the role of student member of the board and, in, uh, and a lot more engagement in the voting for student member of the board. In previous year, the students have only been able to vote for the student member of the board for the past two years. Uh, when I was elected, there were only about three to 4,000 students that actually participated in the vote. But in previous years, there were upwards of 10,000, 11,000 students who were able to participate and really engage. And so I'm wondering if maybe the board could work on uh, maybe hearing a report on how the election process goes for a student member of the board, because I'd ask as a question, do you guys all know how the student member is elected, what all the processes that go into that are, the different stages that are applied to that. There's a lot of things that happen to get to the position here. And I don't think the public really knows kind of what those stages are, and students really know what those stages are. So I'd like the board to kind of take a step in talking more about the student member of the board position and in working to increase student engagement with that. Montgomery County student member of the board is known by every single student in their system because of how much energy is put into their election and how the uh, student on the board, I mean, they have, they, they partner with the Maryland election someone, something. They're like the seventh largest election in the state of Maryland for their student member of the board. So I think we could be doing a lot more to increase student member of the board election and because that's a yearly election, um, it could be a great conversation to be having. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or suggestions or comments? And feel free also to Email. Yes, Ms. Causey. I don't think your mic is on. <laughs> Thank you. One of the um, things that we've heard um, consistently, we heard it this evening from our um, public comments and also from our key stakeholder comments is about responsiveness from the board, is about not just um, discussing things or not just receiving input, but then providing responses. Um, it's been discussed and requested um, multiple times in how to do that. And I think this board really needs to, um, in the coming weeks, uh, figure out with Dr. Williams and his team 
how that can be accomplished. Um, so there, you know, there's a lot of concerns, and if we can address them in a public way, then that would allow other people to feel, to, to number one, know that information, uh, but also to feel that they are being included, that their concerns are being addressed, and that would um, fulfill some of the other efficiency review uh, recommendations. The other thing is uh, I wanted to uh, make a motion that the board engage MABE in their board academy class. MABE and the board officers can discuss and determine whether we start at level one basic or level two advanced. A goal would be to initiate the academy at the earliest opportunity, and I am getting ready to email that. Well. Is there a second? I'm sorry, was that already part of the plan you just announced? Yeah, it's um, also a point of information. In presentation? Um, I did speak with me. That's not currently being um, offered right now. They didn't have a date for when it was being offered because the program is costly and you have to have buy-in from the entire board. So it's something that we would need to discuss first because if we are not all agreeing to it, then it would not happen. So it's a larger discussion and also it's very costly. It costs thousands of dollars and is that where we want to be putting um, uh, our money into um, that program that we're not sure when it's scheduled. Um, May I so, um, yeah, but the, the motion hasn't been seconded yet. Sorry. Oh, okay. I don't know what the motion is. So I already um, looked into it and, and um, looked into the feasibility of doing something like that. So. Thank you for your questions. Um, I did email. I didn't have questions. I was, I was clarifying. It's not a, um, if you make a, a motion for us to do, I guess I would need you to clarify what your motion is because there's no available date right now for, for that. So I emailed uh, my motion to the full board. Um, also, I brought this up in a prior meeting and I also emailed yesterday uh, mm -hmm. and said that uh, I, I was hoping to look at the operational review report, um, but it was attached today, not yesterday, and that I would be making this motion. So I did send that out. And the, my understanding from Mabe's website is that um, they developed the course with the district individually, so it would be up to uh, our board to develop it with them. They're also going to um, continue to provide professional development in a remote setting if that's preferred, because then it's easier to fit into everyone's schedule. Um, and the $2,000, uh, $2,000 to $3,000 that you reported in the report is consistent with the website, which said $2,000. And if you consider that 10 members of the board going to a regular workshop that's for everybody in the district, not for us specifically, 10 times $75, $750. So for two sessions, essentially, we would spend um, <laughs> 1,500 or three sessions, we'd, we'd spend more than that, and it wouldn't be individualized. It wouldn't be specific to our board and our district and the growth that we need. Um, it could all, I, I put more comments in and also additional information from the website. This is the second time I've emailed it. Um, and I just think that it would really allow this board to uh, continue to improve and to incorporate transition, as was pointed out with someone else um, on the board, transitioning, making transitioning smoother for new board members that may be coming in after the election next year. So um, again, Ms. Causey, th that there, there is new, as in the, was in the presentation, there is new member training. And um, yes, you did send this over, I believe it was the day before um, or so. And, but the, the thing is, is that we as a board would need to discuss, is this the direction that we want to go in as a board? Because it's quite costly. I reached out to Mabe directly. It's quite costly for something that we may as or may not, and we have to have full board participation. 
So I think we would need to find out first if we want if it's something we want to do. I don't think it's a it's it's appropriate right now. That's not a motion that I'm going to bring to the floor because I don't feel it's an appropriate motion right now to force an additional training that we as a board have not discussed. So well, that's the point of the motion is to provide the opportunity to discuss because according okay. to the Open Meetings Act, we can't discuss it outside of an open board meeting. So yes, yeah, so I don't. I'm, that's not a motion I feel that we should um, bring to the floor. Was there a second for Ms. Clausey's motion? Okay, so since there's no second, then um, we're moving on. Ms. Hen, you said you had a comment? I did. I just wanted to speak to um, the topic in general, and that is um, there was a finding or recommendation in the operational efficiency report regarding training, and to your point, Mrs. Clausey, and to Mr. Kuhn's, it had to do with training. Um, in that several um, recommendations were made, one for pre-candidate board materials and training sessions to Mr. Kuhn's point, as well as um, more intensive board member professional development. And one of the action items that board leadership has committed ourselves to is working with um, Superintendent Williams and the board office on develop looking at our budget and and seeing what, what resources we do have and how those align with our professional development goals because we have not um, provided the, the strategic type of planning to date that I feel is necessary to meet this um, recommendation adequately. And that's an action item that we've committed to, to looking at to see what resources we would need in order to um, respond to this recommendation. So to your point, that is an activity that needs to happen. I believe, you're, as Ms. Scott said, your, your motion is um, a bit premature. We need to take a look at that and take a look at what resources are available in our operating budget for that activity. And then this is certainly one option that, that the board can consider. So does that okay. mean, so, excuse Chair, me, point excuse me, Ms. Clausey, you weren't recognized. We were going around, but the, the, the motion, so the motion was made, it didn't have a second. So we're not discussing the motion um, anymore. It, now we're on the efficiency review and the discussion. And if anyone had any comments about that, yes, Ms. Rowe. So I just wanted to request from board leadership that when you're reviewing other types of trainings, um, I recall that we had a discussion that it could be very useful to have training on how to actually fill out a, a superintendent evaluation. Um, some of us on the board have never filled out any evaluation of any kind on any employee in our lives. And so having um, the MAB training specifically on that, I think, could be useful. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And thank you, Ms. Hen, for all of your help and everything in the presentation. And thank you, everybody, for your comments. The next item on the agenda is the report on the college and career readiness pathway, advanced placement. And for that, I call on Dr. Wheatley Phillip, Mr. Conley, Dr. Woolridge, Mr. Kearns, and Mr. Waiku. So good evening, everyone. I'm going to start. We believe that students should access, should have access to an instructional environment that recognizes and nurtures their potential. And in our board policy, 6401, and the superintendent's rule, 6401, we and BCPS provide many programs and services where students have access and opportunities to accelerate, extend, and enrich their learning. One of those ways is through our advanced placement program in our high schools. So tonight we have a team that will present one of our ways to prepare our students to be college and career ready or CCR. And tonight's focus is on advanced placement. We have developed a cross divisional presentation and staff from various offices are present in the, in the audience as well. But joining us right now at the table we have the proud principal of Delaney High School, Mr. Sam Winecoop. We have our coordinator of college and career readiness, Dr. Heather Woodridge. We have our executive director of performance management and assessment, Mr. Kevin Connolly. And seated at the table behind Mr. Connolly, we have our chief accountability officer, Dr. Wheatley Phillip. 
Thank you, Dr. Williams. Our BCPS campus prioritizes outcomes for graduating students who are ready for college, career, and service. From this goal, critical benchmarks and transition points were identified to provide insight as to whether students were on the right pathway. Our Compass Commitments for Focus Area 1 Learning Accountability and Results establishes targets and goals for all students to demonstrate continuous growth and achievement. Learning is our core purpose. Our most critical work results in graduating students across multiple pathways who meet and exceed college and career readiness standards. Next slide, please. Our BCPS Compass outlines a clear pathway to ensure that our students are ready for the future. The College and Career Readiness and College Completion Act of 2013 has established several methods by which students can receive the CCR designation. One is by earning a passing score on the identified AP exam. By earning a three or higher on AP exams, students are able to earn college credit which saves time and money. The percentage of students earning a three or higher on an AP exam is one way schools can earn credit for a well-rounded curriculum, whereas the percentage of students enrolled in any AP course is one way schools can earn points for access to a well-rounded curriculum. There are many resources and initiatives to assist our students in being ready for college and careers. The next slides will provide you with an overview of a few at the system school and student levels, in addition to resources that are available for parents and caregivers. On the next slide, Dr. Wooldridge will share the impact of advanced placement coursework on our students and staff. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Wheatley Phillips. Good evening. Advanced placement courses provide students with access and exposure to rigorous college level coursework in high school with the potential to earn college credit and fulfill college course prerequisites. Research shows that students enrolled in advanced placement courses are more likely to attend and graduate in four years than students who do not enroll in AP courses. The likelihood of graduating from a four-year institution increases when students not only enroll in an AP course, but also sit for the end of course AP exam. Finally, students who enroll in an AP course, sit for the end of course AP exam, and earn a score of three or higher are the likeliest to graduate from a four-year institution. Next slide, please. BCPS offers course AP courses at each of our 25 high schools. Over 8,500 unique students enrolled in more than 16,000 AP courses during the 2020-2021 school year. Of the 8,500 students who took at least one AP course, almost 4,500 took at least one exam. There were 2,700 students who took AP courses and earned the college credit with a three or higher on their end of course exams. To increase access for taking AP, AP exams costs were fully funded by BCPS for all students who receive free and reduced meals and all students who are enrolled or were enrolled in CEP schools. In addition to the opportunity to earn college credit through AP courses, BCPS partners for the, with the Community College of Baltimore County to provide early college access through dual enrollment programs and BCPS offers international baccalaureate courses. BCPS is committed to providing rigorous and relevant coursework to support our students' college and career readiness skills. On the next slide, Mr. Connolly will provide an overview of the AP exam performance. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Woolridge, and good evening. <clears throat> of the 4,446 students who were enrolled in at least one AP course, and took the corresponding AP exam, 62.1% earned a three or higher with the possibility of earning college credit. Overall, while the data displayed shows a high rate of students earning a three or greater on the AP exams, a closer look at performance by student group provides us insight into gaps in participation and performance for specific students. For example, while black or African-American students comprised approximately 40%, of our student population. Less than 28% of students participating in one or more AP courses are black or African American students, and only 22% of our AP students who scored a three or greater were students who are black or African American. 
As a system, we need to be deliberate and intentional in how we provide access and opportunity for all students to participate and meet with success in rigorous coursework, regardless of race, native language, socioeconomic level, or a specific need for differentiated instruction or accommodations. We must prioritize equity and access, equity and opportunity, and equity and achievement for all students. This evening, we will highlight system and school level initiatives and strategies to increase access and rigorous coursework while improving student achievement outcomes. Next slide, please. BCPS has implemented high level system initiatives to support the advanced placement CCR pathway. The GT Honors AP and IB System Improvement Team Workgroup examines historical and current trend data for student participation and performance by school, course, and student group. Based on these analyses, the workgroup proposes continuous improvement initiatives designed to increase student access, opportunity, and achievement in rigorous coursework. Recommendations include programs, initiatives, partnerships, and professional learning. Examples of past professional learning was an AP symposium hosted by BCPS, which included breakout sessions for AP teachers focusing on content, teaching GT students, and supporting students who are from traditionally underrepresented groups. The Equal Opportunity School's mission is to ensure that students of color and low-income students have equitable access to America's most academically intense high school programs and succeed at the highest levels. The partnership model is consultative, collaborative, and requires a commitment to specific and measurable results. Three BCPS high schools are participating in a pilot with equal opportunity schools to identify students of color and students from low income households who qualify for, but are missing from advanced placement classes. The partnership begins with a review of each school's enrollment data disaggregated by racial and socioeconomic demographics. Next, teachers and students complete a survey to share their thoughts, feelings, and expectation, uh, expectations around participation in AP classes at their school. The school's equity teams then review the survey data and create an outreach plan. Finally, the plan is implemented to ensure that students are enrolled match students in their demographics of color and more students from lower socioeconomic families into AP courses are enrolled while supporting their academic success. This evening, we're going to highlight intentional work by dedicated school staff to increase opportunities for AP access for all students while maintaining high levels of performance. Mr. Weinkoop, proud principal of Delaney High School, will share some of the AP resources that are available for teachers, students, and parents. Next slide, please. Good evening, members of the board, and proud indeed. To support our AP teachers, there are a range of resources and opportunities. Teachers can access discipline-specific webinars as well as lesson plans and sample questions through the College Board themselves. Additional AP resources are available through the Khan Academy platform. The AP Summer Institute deepens the professional knowledge and instructional capacity of AP teachers through comprehensive training and collegial support. The Office of College and Career Readiness through a grant from MSDE will fund 115 AP teachers to attend the 2022 AP Institute at Goucher College. Also, many of our high schools will utilize their local budgets to send additional teachers beyond that grant. We have found that the Goucher Institutes are vital for providing the initial keys for leading students through our various AP programs. Our AP teachers also engage in an AP Schoology group in which teachers can share their experiences and learn from other AP teachers across our BCPS system. Many hands make light work. So as a result, we prioritize having multiple teachers teach the same AP class. This allows for direct on-site collaboration for teachers of the same subject. In-house and department-level PLCs additionally provide another layer of support to further build our programs and help our students achieve. Next slide, please. Offering a variety of AP courses at every comprehensive high school is a priority for our school system. 
Access to AP courses for all students is critical to continue our work in dismantling instructional barriers which result in inequitable outcomes for our most marginalized students. Student recruitment efforts for AP participation led by our amazing school counselors, informed teachers, and administrators who advocate for students results in increased AP access for all of our student groups. System initiatives such as AVID, funding of exams for qualifying students that may not receive fee waivers from our college board, system-wide PSAT administration which informs AP potential, and the use of multiple data points and surveys provide additional opportunities for students to have access to AP courses while potentially earning college credits. Our school-based AP coordinators support the recruitment of AP students and manage the logistics for ordering and scheduling exams, providing fee exemptions for eligible students and assisting students in accessing support resources from the College Board. The College Board provides a host of resources to support student understanding and application of learning for AP coursework. The AP Classroom provides content-specific study materials, practice exam questions, and other supports. Teacher professional learning includes the use of support materials to enhance teaching and learning. All BCPS AP students have access to a repository of AP resources to support their success in college level coursework while providing them with the opportunity to earn college credit and fulfill college course prerequisites. AP teachers work closely with students to provide the support, guidance, and encouragement to promote student perseverance and success in a rigorous teaching and learning experiences. Next slide, please. And for our parents, the College Board and BCPS provide resources to parents and caregivers through online links and portals. The resources are intended to promote parent understanding and engagement in the AP pathway for college and career readiness while providing background information in courses and assessment, dashboard to track their students progress, and free daily lessons for every course to support student access to additional instructional opportunities. Many of our individual schools host registration information nights, registration open houses, elective fairs, or similar that are designed to provide our parents with important information about classes, class choice, including advanced placement. The BCPS Parent University complements the AP College and Career Readiness Pathway by providing additional resources to support parent and caregiver understanding and knowledge of resources available to support the success of their child. While we have much to celebrate, there's a lot more to be done, and the next slide will provide a high-level overview of our continued work. Thank you, Mr. Weinkoop. Advanced placement courses are one pathway for students to develop the knowledge and skills needed to meet the college and career readiness standards. We celebrate the students at Delaney High School who are enrolled in at least one advanced placement course. Their most recent data show from 2018 to 2021, consistencies in the number of students participating in advanced placement by grade level. For the 2021 school year, there were 65 ninth graders, 186 10th graders, 162 11th graders, and 144 grade 12 students. Last year, over 550 students at Delaney High School were enrolled in one or more AP course. Of that total group, 79.9% earned a three or higher on the AP exam. Our continued work at the school level utilizes an equity lens to examine AP courses offered and student group participation levels. The use of multiple data points in recruiting a diverse student group to participate in AP courses and strategies and supports to promote equity in achievement for all students. At the system level, our focus on equity in access, opportunity, and achievement is promoted through ongoing professional development for AP teachers, coordinators, and school leadership teams while examining and institutionalizing best practices, such as those researched and recommended by our system improvement team. Next slide, please. We thank you very much for your time and attention this evening. Later this month, we will take a deeper dive into another important college and career readiness pathway, dual enrollment. We will continue to provide updates on our student participation, performance, and our progress towards ensuring that they are college and career ready. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. And we'll start with questions. I guess we'll start around here. Uh, we'll start first with Mr. Kuhn, and then we'll work our way around. Thank you for this presentation, and congratulations to Delaney. They do a fantastic job. And um, APs are um, basically college classes that are being given in high school. And, and, and you reach that level by getting through and building a strong foundation and growing through and then achieving um, and working very hard because it's a tremendous amount of content in a short amount of time. And while I commend um, our colleague uh, from Delaney uh, and, and, and it's great to, to kind of share how well they're doing, my concern is really at the other end of the scale. Um, I'm not really worried about Delaney because I understand how successful they are. I'm concerned about schools that are not as successful as Delaney uh, with AP content. And I, I, had asked for a I had asked a question and I sent an email um, hoping to have more data that was school specific so we could actually see what's happening in the schools. And I hope uh, at some point that that's provided to the entire board um, and made available to the public because it will tell, um, you know, tell a, an important story. And, and as we're looking at the path of children to, to, and students as they achieve and grow, my concern is that path. Where along that path are we failing and how do we correct it so that every school is achieving like Delaney is? I want every, every high school principal up here telling us the same thing, saying 80% of our kids that took them got a three year above. That that is not the case. Unfortunately, we, we can't see that data. I'm sure you have it somewhere. Um, and I hope that we can get there. But understanding the path and what makes uh, a student successful enough to achieve at that level is the key to all of this. So it's time. I'm not quite sure how, how you relay that to us. So thank you, Mr. Kuhn, for the question. And you're absolutely right. We do have data. And one of the things that we really work to do internally within BCPS is as we have data that are available, we really work first with our school teams to be able to share the data with them, to have them identify their best practices and to identify ways within which as they look at their data and they look at their demographics, they can identify individual plans. And so part of what we have done is really in pulling the data together, our plan is to share the information with our school leaders, have in-depth conversations with them, and then be able to share that information with you. We did receive your email and we thank you for that. But part of our internal process is to work internally at the school level first. So we start with that part and then we extend up to the whole. We certainly have members here from central office, Dr. Woolrich team, who will, who will also serve as advisors to help school teams and we will have the information available. But I think part of what we want to do right now is to look at the data, to have conversations at the school level, to work with our school leaders, to look at best practices such as what we see here at Delaney and to be able to have those conversations within and among zones so that we can make sure we're sharing those best practices and we're able to help all students. Next, um, we're going around Dr. Hager. Yes, um, I'm actually glad I went after Mr. Kuhn because I had a similar question. I, I think the two data points that I also would like to see would be the percentage of students who score three or better, as we just, just talked about, but also that percentage of students that are enrolled in the class and actually take the test by school. And I'm very curious about whether uh, the adoption of CEP at um, a larger number of high schools has changed that in any way and in making that test available to any student in that school? Has that modified the process? And I'm particularly cu curious because it sounds like, like only about 50% of the kids who enroll in an AP course take the test. And I'm kind of new to this as a parent of a high schooler and it's hard to sign up for those tests. <laughs> so I find it incredibly challenging to go through the, the website and everything. And so in the schools where every child is eligible who be, be, through the C, through community eligibility provision, um, is it up to the parents to sign that child up or is the school helping them since everybody can sign up for it? So is there, are we, are we removing barriers to the kids in CEP schools to enrolling in the course? In the middle of saying enrolling in the test. I'm going to ask if Dr. Woldridge can maybe provide some insight regarding that. Thank you. Yes. We 
encourage all of our students to take the exams. Um, there is, a, this year, again, there is a fee for unused exams. So we do ask that our AP coordinators are working with the students and the AP teachers and the parents to make sure that the student is committed to uh, taking that test before we register them so that if they, they we just, you know, uh, order to test for everyone, then we would have to pay $40 for every student that doesn't actually take the test. So we just want to work with the families and the, and the students and the teachers mm -hmm. to make sure that um, they're committed. And that is why College Board moved the registration date up earlier. Previously, um, it used to be <laughs> in March, as you know, and uh, now we are approaching the deadline, November 15th. So it's so that they commit early and then they study hard all year long and they sit for the exam. And so do, does the school system help them sign up or is it still up to the student and the parent to sign up in those schools? Um, so the AP coordinator is actually the one that clicks the button, oh, good. Um, but they okay. do not do that without the permission of the family. Okay, no, that, that was my class. And, and then just kind of following up with that, do we have data on what the barriers are to taking the test? That, that 50 percent that takes the course and not the test? Has anyone ever explored kind of why that is? So I think last year was unique. Um, we had two years during the pandemic where a uh, college board adjusted its own policies and procedures for AP exams, it, which greatly impact, uh, impacted our students. So in, twen in 2020, when we first went home in March, mm -hmm. um, AP, the college board immediately turned and um, put their exam online and removed the multiple choice aspect. So it was only a written response uh, exam. I think that shocked some of our students. And then the next year, college, uh, this past year, College Board put their entire exam online, multiple choice and free response. And I think some students felt that that was daunting. Mm -hmm. uh, despite you know, the hard work of their teachers and prepping all year long, I do believe that we will, see, um, we will rebound and see the numbers that we used to see, which are much higher. And we can certainly provide that data for you. Um, go back a couple years pre-pandemic and then this year, I'm, we're going to blow you away with the number of exams that are taken. <laughs> That's just great. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Ms. Pastor? Okay. I'm glad to hear you have a grant. You say that send, sending the AP teachers, yes, all categories, yes, right? Because that's been a problem that not all of the teachers took advantage of it. So now all teachers are doing that, correct? Is that what you're saying? We will be able to fiscally sponsor 115 uh, teachers this summer due to the MSDE grant. Okay. All right. So that's another conversation about how you pick those 115 teachers because that goes into a piece of why students don't score. I'd like to know what your data points, Dr. Hager hit that, but I didn't hear an answer. What do, your, what do your data points tell you are the reasons that the students are not doing well but that you identified in your presentation? I think that's where the conversation at the school level takes place because data just represents numbers and percentages. But the deeper conversation takes place at the school level, looking at school, working with school teams and asking them, when you look at these percentages, what do you think are some of the contributing factors around that? What do they tell you? What are some of the things I want to hear? I would like to hear some of the things that they tell you. Right. So as we shared with Dr. Coons, this is a conversation that we're having with school teams. We haven't shared the data and begun those conversations. But part of what we're doing is reporting the information to members of the board. And once we've had those conversations, we can certainly come back and we can share the information. But the data we collected was extensive. And what we want to do is to be able to first share it with school teams, say, here's what your data show, and then have those conversations and be able to report back what we think are some of the causes. Right now, for us, it would just be assumptions that we're making because we're not in the schoolhouse. But to be able to have those conversations with school teams so that we have the real facts, but it's more so than just having numbers, but being able to look at the resources across the system as the team shared that we can provide, such as information from the system improvement team, from grade level teams, and so forth. I know Mr. Weinkoop is here, and he is our resident expert in terms of some things that are being done. I know that he is the cornerstone the exemplar at this point, but there are specific things done at the school level to really help support the decision making and the reasons why students do well, or some students 
um, don't do well. So any insight that you can provide members of the board at this time, we'd appreciate that. Sure. I think that the thing that's probably the freshest on our mind is 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 what we're, we've gone through, as uh, Dr. Walters said, since March of 2020. This These last two years have been as far as being able to identify and design resources in a global situation has been has been difficult. But what I what I would say is when we start talking about reasons why and things, I can speak specifically to our school team and similar to messages from the from the system at the beginning, we we need to make sure what's our target. Is our target everybody to get a five? Is our target to increase access? Is our target to um, combine those two things? And I think that at the school level, when we do get this data and we look at this data that's inclusive, we can take a look at those things and see where some of those deficiencies are. Is it from our um, underservice or, un or from our black or brown children? Is it from um, ELL students? And we can kind of disaggregate that data and then design our supports around it. For example, um, and, and I know that this, this may sound bad, and, and part of my, my um, remarks earlier were just about the, some of the issues that we've had historically in trying to get to our marginalized students. When I first came to Delaney, um, three out of the 700 students that took the test were African American, three. And one of the things that we wanted to do was look at some of maybe not the words and the bullets is actually start looking at, at the person. Why, why is this? And start really peeling back those layers. And w what we found is there was maybe a humanistic piece that historically, not just at Delaney or just in Baltimore County, but maybe across the country, could be really used. Let's not make this line that we're drawing in the sand that's saying you have AP potential or you don't have AP potential. Let's draw this line in the sand and if you're below that, how am I going to pick you up? And I think that when we started shifting our mindset in that, and again, three to, to where we went was 300%, but that's still not enough. That's still not enough when you go from one year to the next. So it is a systematic thing that we have to look at every year. And unfortunately, with this recent round of looking at our numbers, it really kind of throws a little bit of a wrench into that data set because looking at the data sets now, although it is real data, it's, it's apples to oranges as opposed to what we were doing historically leading up to that. Now, like we said before, this year, this is a critical year. This is a critical year to have the humanistic approach to the AP, not only to the AP, but also to our standards classes. But I think that this is going to be the year where the college board starts getting back to having their exam be, be more uh, more consistent than what it was as, in the first two years. Um, as a parent, I've, I've worked with many parents on the registration and things like that. It, is, it has been cumbersome the last couple years, but we need to make sure that we keep our focus on those kids, getting them in the roles and in the classes and making sure that they're comfortable because if they're not, we shouldn't wait for a score because it's not going to matter. Okay. Um, and I want to thank you for that answer. I was an AP teacher, taught two AP courses before I was a principal and while I was a principal, and I taught for a college board, mm. okay? So I'm very familiar with college board. And in those schools about which you spoke, there are some very clear discrepancies and some very clear things that need to be fixed. One is taking care of those teachers in the school. Second, and being very specific about the fact that this is a critical thinking, to, uh, those tests are critical thinking, how you approach multiple choice, how you process the question so that you can um, answer it appropriately, okay, based on, and I taught the language, I, mm, I taught language one year and then the literature, each one building on the other. So that's why I asked, what are you finding? Because as a teacher, I talked to other teachers of AP in those schools that were not doing well. And our answers were pretty much the same. And we could see also who was being selected to teach them. So it's that's time. important. I know. Thank you. That's important. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. 
Uh, so Eastern Tech is definitely not like Delaney in the number of AP courses that are offered, because I've heard of some of the students at Delaney that are taking six, seven, eight AP courses and really uh, doing amazing things at Delaney. But at Eastern, one of the barriers that I'm noticing is with our magnet program, um, the access to AP courses has definitely not been as, as good as it could be. For example, last year I did a lot of advocacy at Eastern Tech to try to get an AP compared to government course, but we just couldn't get it because we didn't have the room with our capacity. We didn't have the ability, so we now we're alternating years. And I'm a, I've taken eight AP courses throughout my term time in high school. I'm taking two this year right now. So there, I know how intense they can be, but that access is not the same throughout the county. Delaney, I visited Towson High School today, and the same thing was true with Towson High School with students taking six, seven, eight AP courses. But I go to Chesapeake High School, and you know they're just getting started with offering AP uh, science courses, and they're just getting started with offering AP courses. And so I'm wondering if there's data about how many AP classes are offered in each of our schools. Yes, Mr. Connolly, did you want to provide some clarity regarding that? Yes, uh, one of the uh, <clears throat> uh, prepared workbooks that we developed was based not just on the access, but looking at schools and then courses that are offered within schools and then participation um, by all as well as by student groups. So really getting into some of the things that um, Mr. Wanku was talking about of looking at, you know, not only what we offer, but then who takes advantage of what's being offered. And then how do we provide the supports, the beliefs, and our own uh, initiatives it, to expand that net? Because even if we're increasing opportunities and access and offerings, it's still not enough. We have to continue to build on that momentum and grow as we move forward. Okay, and can the board receive like data though for how many classes like we currently have enrolled where students are in AP courses so we can kind of visualize uh, how each school uh, kind of looks? So we prepared uh, data for Dr. Williams and uh, we're in a review in process. So let me just remind the board, this is a first review of college and career ready. So a couple of things I just wanna bring our attention to that as a system, we haven't talked more about college and career ready and all those components. This is one of many aspects. The AP data, as we've heard, we've had two outlier of years. And, and sharing that, absolutely we'll share it. We do have to finalize the data. We have to scrub the data in terms of any numbers that are less than 10. I think that's the, the magic, you know, in terms so you don't identify specific students. So today's presentation was to say, here's one aspect. But what you'll hear in two weeks is that we not only provide advanced placement, we provide dual enrollment. And because of that, uh, you may see at every school, they won't offer all AP because there's the dual enrollment where students have an opportunity to take a college class, pass the class, and get credit, just like yeah. one would do with an advanced placement class. So I don't want you to think this is, this is not the full picture of what we're doing with AP. I wanna go back to what was in the presentation. We deliberately created a system improvement team to address all of these issues. There's an access and opportunity issue. So how do we look at every school and say, we want more students, what are those barriers? We deliberately said, we gotta get the student voice because the students will tell us why he or she is not enrolling in a class, why he or she is not taking the exam, what are those barriers? And so we created the system improvement team last year in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of a change from the college board. So tonight was trying to set up, this is what we had had in place, this is where we are as an overview but absolutely we'll drill down and work with our school principals as to what are you doing to really get more students to take the course and to take the exam. Because there's reasons as to why some students take the course and choose not to take the exam. And it's not just, it's cumbersome. There's some reasons that we have to know why. But let me just be real clear. Our kids need to feel welcome in any one of these classes. That's the reality. You can ask all the questions, but the reality is those principals know we will be here for four hours talking about all of our high schools. These principals know there are barriers. Kids feel they don't see themselves in these classes. They want to be welcome. The teachers need to be trained and supported. 
That's the purpose of the system improvement team. We are being very deliberate about opening access. And it's not just about AP. And it's not just about a, a, a grade of three, a score of three or, or better. If you take it, there's research saying you're better prepared. Take the course. You're better prepared to take, uh, to be successful in college. So we need to stop just looking at a score. And we need to stop looking at one data point. The sheet was clear. College and career ready requires multiple data points. And if you think a student can go in ninth grade and be prepared and say, I'm going to take an IB class, I'm going to take an AP class, that's why we're looking at articulation from elementary to middle and middle to high. This is the work that we are being very deliberate thanks to our principals, our school side, and our research side, and curriculum. I won't forget curriculum. It is all of this. What you're just getting is a glimpse today, ladies and gentlemen. But the real work is working with those individuals like Mr. Winecoop and his team. Let's break down what's going on. But we talked about it. The real value is hearing from what our teachers are saying and especially our students. So I just want to refocus the board just a little bit. This is not one and done. And we're not going to have all the answers today because if we could do that, we would have 80% of our kids. But we don't, we got to find out what are those answers. And the answers lie in all of our high schools. And that's the work that these principals are doing and their AP coordinators. So yes, there are some differences in terms of how many, a school has eight, a school has five. But the school grew to that five in a year, give them another time to grow with more staffing and more support so they can offer. But there's a, we were gonna do this uh, discussion about dual enrollment. Dual enrollment is a good thing, but that is impacting some options because students may say, well, why would I wanna take an AP course if I can fit a, a, a college course in my, in my schedule and go to CCBC and get the credit? So, so, so I think what we can do with these questions, we're happy to circle back, but this is an ongoing discussion. But what I want to just paint, is that why we had Mr. Weinkoop to share a little bit of what was happening in his, in his school, as well as work with all of our principals to really get to what we need to do to improve access and opportunities and look at removing those barriers. We want to thank the board for all of the budget to support, supporting our kids with the fees and the examinations. We want to thank the board for the equal opportunity to do just that. Let's look at three of our schools and study what's getting in the way. What are the barriers? What are the challenges? So I would offer, give us some opportunity to come back and share like, here's our successes. Here's what we're seeing, Ms. Ms. Pastor, as a barrier. And how do we work with all of our schools to figure out how do we remove those barriers? But from my experience as a teacher, as a principal, is what's happening in those schools. Are those students feel that they have that support? Do they see themselves in those classrooms? Are the teachers getting that kind of professional development that they need? And what we have done, we've given the funds. We have the funds. We probably could use more. I, I mean, put that out there. <laughs> we have the funds. But we got to look at why are we seeing a lower percentage of students taking an exam or not getting a score. But there's still research. If you take and sit, you are better prepared if you don't hit that mark of a three. But remember, AP is just one of many ways to determine a student is college and career ready. So I would just say, if there's some additional questions, we'll have the data. Our principals need to see that data. Our school side need to work with our principals and say, what are those barriers? Talk to us. What do you need? That's their role. Like uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillips said, they can provide the data. It's more than just the data. We got to drill down and figure out what's causing this to happen. But keep in mind, last year was some challenges and the year before as well. 
So I think Dr. Wheatley said, Phillips said this before, it's like apples and oranges. And if we look at previous data points, so I just want to make that point to the board that this is just the beginning of our work. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, were you finished or you had another question? I did have another question. It was about, um, so in previous years for fee reductions for AP exams, we used the farms data, but I don't believe this year we were collecting farms data because we have free meals for all students. So I was just wondering how is it that we're um, providing those free exams for students. I haven't filled out my form and they're due tomorrow, so I have to fill that out. Uh, but I was just wondering if you could provide some insight into that. Great question. I, I, I hope many people hear the answer because BCPS does have a um, self-disclosure letter that students and families can fill out and bring confidentially to the advanced placement coordinator at their schools. And then they too will be checked off as um, eligible for the fee reduction for the AP exams and their fees will be covered by our uh, grants. Okay, and that's a reduction in the fee? Yes, College Board offers a fee reduction and then right. our grant covers that fee reduced exam. Okay. So the students are not charged. Awesome, thank you so much. And uh, I'm just, I just wanted to state this. I, I think it would be really great if going in the future, uh, the board could consider possibly the budget um, figuring out a way to make exams free for all students, the AP exams. I know that there is a significant financial burden going into the $96 for typical exams, $126 sometimes for AP seminar and AP research exams. So I think it'd be cool if we could look into that. It's time, okay. Ms. Hen, did you have any comments? I do, just a quick comment and a question, and thank you for your presentation. This has been fantastic. Um, what gives me anxiety about this is not one of our processes, but rather the College Board's exam process itself and what that does to our students and how we can best support them in this. Um, speaking from someone who may or may not live in my house, um, she botched the exam process on one of her AP exams, got all the way to the finish line and blew it on the test, knew the content, was prepared, um, excellent school, prepared her the best, absolute best they could, didn't upload a file in the right place and bam, that was it. The College Board is not forgiving when it comes to minor I issues like that and there was nothing that could be done. Nothing her school could do, the AP coordinator could do, the college board could do. We were, you know, up against the wall. And, you know, what do you do? And here's someone with every support in the world, you know, from the school, from home, you name it. I can't think of what someone with less resources would be up against in that situation. I don't know if we have data on those students, but that's what keeps me up at night, is worrying about those students who, you know, they go through all these efforts, go through the entire course, they're prepared, their school, you know, their principal, their AP coordinator, everyone goes, you know, the extra mile for them and they get to the finish line and then that happens. So what are we doing? What can we do to ensure they cross the finish line? They, they have the intent, the motivation, they want to get there. Can we, it's, again, it's not our process, but again, it's a constraint that they, they are faced with. How do we help with the, the logistics, the operations, the technical, whatever it is? Because that's something where, you know, we have no control over the, you know, it's the college board's process, but they're our kids. And we want to ensure that they're successful in that. So some feedback, a story, so, um, and some, a desire. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you, and going around, did you have anything, Ms. Jones? I'm just going around, because I, I, it seemed like everyone had something to say. Thank you. Uh, many of my questions were asked to, to kind of piggyback of what Ms. Hen just said. Entering, um, filling out those forms is incredibly difficult, and for somebody like that sit on the board over here, highly educated, if it's hard for us, I kind of wonder how hard it will be for people um, that don't have the time that are averse to filling out forms, and how are we catching those kids? Uh, and congratulations to Delaney for being, and if you were to use that as a pilot school to emulate that across, you just look at two or a few miles down from Delaney, Lock Raven Academy. I want to see how many AP classes are being offered there, if you could provide that. If you could give me how many AP classes are being offered at Overly, Owings Mills, Kenwood, 
and, and what could we do to bridge that gap? And, and thank you, Dr. Williams, because you kind of clarified that a lot of it is in the thinking, uh, but to see that visually will help help the board, um, you know, support this program more when it comes to budget uh, so that we could help. I guess that's one way that we could help is, is uh, putting that in the budget. So thank you for, and we look forward to the next presentation as well. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I want to thank you for the time and energy that you put into this presentation. I thought you did an outstanding job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, I have one comment, one comment and three questions. I have three daughters, all of whom attended the same high school. One of my daughters took and did well on nine AP classes, and the other two did not take any. And as I sit here tonight, I can't remember why. Um, so the question that's being asked, why do some kids do it and some other kids don't, I can't even remember for my own children. Um, my one first question is to Mr. Kuhn and Dr. Hager's point, what is the timeline, Dr. Wheatley Phillips, for analyzing, scrubbing the data with schools and then providing it to the board? So I will answer that. Um, the data, we will have an update to the board on schools um, let's say, Dr. Wheatley Phillips, by December. We can have that ready yeah. for that time. Yeah. Because it's because not I just the data, it's also me, a written report yeah, but that Dr. really Wheatley provides Phillips, that analysis. Let me, let me just finish. Because I think, to your point, everyone wants to see specific schools and see how students are doing. And I think we need to put a caveat about what was like with the College Board last year. And we have previous data uh, the year be year before, um, and I think what will be helpful, uh, getting back to several comments, there is differences. There's there's inconsistencies across the system, hence why we have a system improvement team. We want to understand why some students are taking AP and some aren't, and AP is not just the only answer. There are multiple ways of getting college and career ready. Again, I'm going to go back to that slide. We're showing one piece of multiple ways of saying our students are college and career ready. So give us some opportunities. We heard December, but the bigger piece is what the principals of schools are doing. You can support us with budget. You can support us with training, but the real work is happening at the school level. Um, and I will also task Dr. Yarbrough and her team as we're looking at professional learning that we can circle back of what we're doing with professional learning with our, with our AP or with our staff in general, but definitely with our AP. So I think the desire to have the data is warranted. What you will do with it, I hope it leads to policy and budget but the real work is what we're doing with our schools and our principals. So I thank you for that. Uh, my next question is, um, one of the benefits of a program like Open Court in elementary school is that it's a very defined way of delivery, and if it's delivered the way that it's trained, we know that students benefit. How are we ensuring consistent delivery of AP content across all schools? How are we measuring AP teacher efficacy? Good question. We'll follow up with that. Thank you, Ms. Mack. And then my last question is about the Equal Opportunity Schools, Catonsville, Milford Mill, and Perry Hall. Can you tell me the start date and the end date of the pilot and if there are any preliminary findings at this point that would be beneficial for the board to hear? We can provide that information as well. Just because we have to, we have, we'd have to talk to several offices to get the information, but we can provide that information as well. Okay, thank you. I look forward to seeing it. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for the presentation and for pulling the information together. Ms. Causey? Um, the microphone. I want to thank Lily for turning on my microphone multiple <laughs> times during the meeting. So there you go. I'm done. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you all for the presentation. Um, and I just wanted to quickly speak to Dr. Williams' points about policy and budget. Um, 
I have some comments and then I'll have uh, a couple questions. But um, at one point in 2014, um, 2015, I was doing some as a parent education advocate um, analysis around the advanced placement testing access, um, test taking and test passing among the high schools in BCPS. And uh, one of the takeaways was that if a student was attending Delaney, they were more likely to take an AP test if they were making a C in the course. But at other schools, they were less likely to take the AP test if they were receiving a C in the course. Um, but the pass rate among C students was similar. So what is it that encouraged a student, and this is before Dr. Weinkoop was there, so I'm not you know, give, getting brownie points here, but so what was it that at Delaney, a student was encouraged to take that AP test when they had a C in the course, um, but wasn't necessarily you know, translated to other schools? Uh, the other thing was that Western Tech, uh, and this is going back to data from 2013, um, they had a high success rate in access, AP taking, and AP passing. Um, and so what, what was it that led to there, uh, to the success there? Um, as a board member in 2015 or 2016, I attended an AP conference that was put on in BCPS. It was held at Lock Raven High School. And I had the opportunity to hear from an amazing teacher at Overly who shared the work at their school in really focusing on increasing access and um, instruction. So I'd like to hey, see that's a little time. more about that, um, to look into the data about that. Okay. Yeah, that's time. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rowe? So there's a, I read through this 18 page report that's up on board docs that I just want to say to the other board members actually does contain a significant amount of data, some of which is data you all are actually asking for. Not, not all of it, but there's stuff in that report. So on page seven, I just want to make sure that I understand what one of these data points means um, because I don't want to misunderstand it. Um, it said these analysis indicate that 8,576 unique st students took at least one AP course and a couple pages prior, it looks like between 16 and 18,000 students over the last several years took multiple AP. So does that mean that roughly 8,000 students took one or more AP exam leading to a cumulative of 60? So we have 110,000 students in our school system. So our participation in the AP program is less than 10%. Is that what that says? Not just high school students. So that's 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th graders. Are there so AP tests for no. middle schoolers? No. So you're just Oh, wait, you got it. Okay. So how many high school students do we have total? Um, I would give a rough estimate of about um, 30, 32,000, roughly. That definitely looks better. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, your initial comments are accurate. So 8,000 know, some yeah, odd. Unique students are a student who took one or more, but the total number of AP tests are because you have students who take multiple AP courses and then exams. So in the beginning of the presentation where you outlined the couple different pathways, how many of our high school students are in one or more of those pathways? Because like, for instance, I know my daughter's in IB, but she also takes AP. So how many, let that 8,000 unique number for AP, do you have a number yet for the unique total number of high school students that participated in any of those um, programs? So I may need some clarification on what you're asking, but let me just give a general overview. Uh, as Dr. Williams had mentioned, college and career readiness occurs in many different formats. There's many ways to earn that college and career readiness. AP is one component of that. Yeah, and you, and you list them in the beginning, yeah, what they all were. Yeah, public schools, right. we have a whole bunch of different courses we offer. But in addition to that, you have dual enrollment, you have right. GPA by the end of grade 11, you have ACTs, um, you have your uh, SAT scores, you have your AP courses, your IB courses, and then you also have um, the CTE uh, 
industry standard certification. Those are all different ways you can earn college maybe, and career readiness. Maybe I ask this question a different way. How many students don't participate in any of that? That's a good question, and we can we, we can look at our. That's data the number I'm interested in, about. because I want to know about those students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then my turn. My question is, as far as briefly, um, some of the questions where it was saying AP course availability at schools. I'm on page three of eight. Um, am I understanding this chart correctly? It says uh, table two, 2020-2021 AP course availability by department and school. And so it lists the school, it lists what zone it's in, and then it lists um, if there's an AP course available in those various departments at the schools. I think there were some um, members who had asked about that. Um, it's not detailed as far as like which, um, I guess, class it is, but it's, it's based on the department. Um, my other question was on page, let's see, I think it's on page 16. Um, it says that there is inequity in enrollment data for AP course enrollment. And I just wanted to know, is that because um, maybe there's inequities because maybe AP courses aren't offered the same everywhere at, at, at every school? Maybe they're offered um, differently in, in different areas. Would that be um, what's attributing to that? I was just trying to get a little bit more information about that. Sure. So if you look at aggregate data, you know, the gaps exist you know, in comparison of student group to student group. Yeah. Within um, individual schools, we have some schools that when you look at just demographics in comparison to participation, that you have a closer match than you have in other schools. Digging deeper into that really becomes that you know, instructional leadership team discussion about the why and do we see ourselves in that course and do we have the supports necessary in order to not only uh, recruit but also to encourage and to dig deeper for those students where instead of drawing a line you're you're um, providing greater opportunity okay Great, thank you for that. And I just want to say also, I think this is a great presentation and as Dr. Williams said, a great first step for um, uh, uh, more to come, to hear more. And I like that it's showing, um, like you all said in here, like with official high school enrollment for that year indicates inequities in AP course enrollment. So you've identified it. And then now what you all are doing is working on, on solving that. So I, I think that's, that's going in, in a good direction. So, thank you. Okay, and I think thank that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank very you much. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. You too. All right, and the next item on the agenda is board member comments and consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. Board members, please note that items provided at past meetings have been received and are being reviewed. So, we'll go around and we'll start first with Ms. Rowe. So I would just like to see um, on the agenda, and I know um, Chair Scott, you said that it would be eventually, but I just want to reiterate um, that I think that some guidance from the rest of the board as to what the efficiency audit recommended versus the Office of Internal Audit would be helpful um, at some point in the future. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Um, thank you. In light of this report, there was discussion last year about the grading and reporting implementation, um, and it was shared by staff that there's inconsistencies in the grading um, uh, mechanism that's used, whether it's the zero to 100 scale or the 50 to 100 scale. And um, it, there was supposed to be information provided to the board. And I think that that, I know that the, it's on an agenda item for May, but I think, um, especially in light of this, it's important for the board to receive that report sooner, but also certainly it could be shared with the board, you know, in the next couple of weeks, uh, what schools are using which scales, um, and is it consistent within schools, or is it also inconsistent within schools? Um, and the college board may, it, does the college board have a different grading scale that it requires um, 
school districts to use for, for those courses. The other thing I'd like to see is um, the draft report or, or form um, that was starting to be used that was shared with the board members of all of the requests that have already been made and uh, where they're lining up. Um, and I know that that uh, was discussed previously with board officers and superintendent. Some of those requests would end up in committees or in a weekly update or um, a memo at, or and some placed on agendas. So I think there's been a lot of input provided by the board and I would find it helpful to have all of that aggregated for us to understand where we are. Thank you. A smack? Um, on Thursday, October 28th, I attended the ribbon cutting ceremony for Chadwick Elementary School. I'd like to say congratulations to Principal Kate Miller and her team on a ceremony that highlighted so many of Chadwick's wonderful students. I'd really like to thank my tour guide, um, a fifth grade student who very efficiently guided myself and other people through the school so quickly and did not miss telling me what was behind every door in the school. Uh, he must have practiced because he said, this is the mechanical room. If you open this door, there's mechanics in there. Um, and I'd like to say congratulations to Mr. Dixit and his team on their work to make the new Chadwick Elementary School a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. People uh, sort of chuckled at me last time when I said, listen up. So I'm going to say, listen up again. <laughs> uh, I've talked about the need to take care of the people that we have. We can't lose our workers. It's a crisis with the recruitment of people, but there's a crisis in retaining people. Now, I was real pleased, you know, anytime the bus drivers got that money, that deal was worked out. I'm real pleased that, with that. But they feel slighted already. I'm hearing that. I went and calculated that thousand dollars over 160 hours a month, over 10 months, 1600. Divided that into a thousand or by a thousand, it comes down to 62 cents an hour that we're giving these people. We have to start right now, and this goes for Case, Tabco, AVSME, ESPBC, and OPE. We got to start building this this budget to give these people something that they deserve, a, a, more than a working right, wage. We've got to start it now. We can't talk about this. We've got to do it. We've got to improve the salaries, with the hourly wage, the working conditions. We've got to give them the tools they need to do their job. We've got to honestly listen to their concerns. We have to improve the communication. There's a reoccurring theme here. Communication is bad, and we've got to improve that. Uh, okay. <laughs> now, I've got an agenda item, and I know I'll come back with something else on that. But we, an agenda item, we talked to, about two years ago about taking this show on the road and taking it to some other areas and letting people that can't drive and can't get out here regularly and opening up this section so more people can sit and give us feedback. We've got to seriously look at that, and I'd like to see that on the agenda next time. Is rotate, and they've done it. They've done it in the past. We can still do it. Is move this around to different areas so that people can see us outside this dais and outside this room. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And Joseph's left. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, so I've been out and about smobbing. That's the new verb I'm kind of using for everything related to smob, smobbing. And I visited 15 of our schools so far. Uh, that's not including the ribbon cutting ceremony. So I've had a lot scheduled. I, my goal is to visit all 175 by the end of my term. It's pretty ambitious. Uh, but Ms. Tracy's or Ms. Gover's been doing an amazing job helping me set those up along with the community superintendents and executive directors. So thank you all so much. Um, I just want to say that I'd like to kind of learn more about the class rank in our schools. Um, I think that I, I want to learn about uh, the value of class rank that we have in our school system and uh, kind of figuring out if it's something that's really necessary and helpful to our students or if it just kind of creates a competitive environment in schools like Delaney, Towson, Eastern Tech, where they're taking so many AP courses and whether or not we should continue recognizing class rank or consider abolishing it as many other counties in uh, the state of Maryland have. Um, so yeah. It's kind of everything, and I hope everyone has a great night. Uh, and thank you all for being amazing. Thank you, Mr. Thank Thomas. You, Ms. Pastor. Mr. Dixit, I guess he's not here. Um, Mr. Dixit, for the work that you do with your team on the schools, Chadwick is fabulous. I agree with Ms. Peck. That little boy was pretty funny. 
Um, uh, what a wonderful school. The principal is a crier. You have to love a crier when you talk about children. So obviously I love her. So thank you to all of you for what you're doing. Um, thank you, Ms. Rowe, for sending in a comment for the priorities list. Please don't forget it. Ms. Hen and Mr. Thomas, uh, you owe me a write-up for your suggestions or they will not be shared because both of them need discussion by the board and I need them because they won't go on the priorities list until the board hears them. And I want to thank um, uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillip, Dr. Yarbrough, Dr. McComas for the work that you are doing um, as exemplified in the presentation tonight. And I look back and I see two of our community soups and I wanna thank you for the work that you're doing. And Mr. Saris, thank you. <laughs> Good night. Dr. Hager? Um, I, I, I know we're not supposed to repeat items, but I've, I've gotten a lot of emails about uh, school meals, and so I would love, love, love to hear a presentation on, on what the issues are around school meals this year, given the um, supply chain concerns and things like that, and just overall what school meals should be looking like, what we want them to look like, things like that. Um, and I was intrigued by the comment earlier about um, sharing what, uh, what it's like to be on the Board of Ed. Given that the appointment committee was just assigned, it might be good maybe to have a not not inside this meeting, but some sort of a separate, you know, uh, town hall or something with board members to share kind of their perspectives on what it's been like. So that if others do are interested in running or trying to go for an appointment, they can make an educated decision. So anyway, just an idea. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Coom. Okay, I'm going to start with um, an idea for an agenda item. Um, so tonight we passed a modification to a contract for an energy consultant. Um, and we discussed this briefly in the contracting committee uh, yesterday. And <clears throat> we talked a little bit about the Baltimore Regional Cooperative Purchasing Committee. Um, and in essence, how we buy energy. And we are a tremendous user of energy. You think about all the facilities we have, think about all the buses we drive all over the county. We are using energy every day, and that is coming right out of our pockets. So we need to think long term on this. And we need to understand all of the, the good things that are occurring and how we're approaching this and how we're buying these commodities and saving uh, the taxpayer dollars going forward, thinking about, you know, going electric or um, solar and uh, using electrical ve electric vehicles in the future. These, all, these things all play together. So I want to throw that out there because we are, we are big buyers. We spend a significant amount of money here. Um, the next thing, I'm going to go back and, and um, just make a few comments real quick about APs. I think that uh, the college board does us a disservice by charging so much for their services. They are supposed to be a not-for-profit entity and as you heard tonight, there's a tremendous amount of money being moved. Um, and I think we need to take them to task over that. And I hope if Dr. Williams gets a chance, he uh, can speak up to that at some point on a large scale. And then finally, um, I do have a question regarding AP study guides, the books that, you know, um, basically the test is based on. If we provide those books, to students, I know I've bought many a book as we've, you know, have had kids take lots and lots of AP tests and they're not cheap and it could be a barrier for people. And I think that, you know, if we're gonna spend money on books and we have significant, you know, uh, amount of kids in those classes that we should provide those for each student for each class that they're in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. And I would just like to, um, Thank everybody for their comments and for their suggestions for agenda setting. And um, I'd also um, 
like to thank Miss Charlie Green <laughs> for sitting in um, so that we could um, have our meeting and everything. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Couldn't have been easy, but um, she hung in there. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So the last item on the agenda is announcements. And the board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021 at 630 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. And the meeting is now adjourned.